morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our fourth emergency medicine seminar series 2022. So, I'm Dr. Yogi, uh, emergency medicine medical officer in Hospital Chancellor Tunku Morris. I will be your moderator for today. So, let me give a brief introduction about each speaker before we start our seminar. So, our first speaker, Dr. Ruth Sabrina, she graduated from uh, USM in 2004 and she did her emergency uh, medicine master's in 2013. She has a special interest in clinical toxicology and accredited from Hong Kong Poison Information Center in United Christian Hospital, Hong Kong. Uh, she's an emergency physician uh, in Hospital Raja Permaisuri Bainun from December 2013 until now, and also a clinical toxicologist. Okay. She's also a member of Malaysian Society of Toxicology and the president of Malaysian Society on Toxinology. And also she's a panel of remote invenimation consultation services, a panel of Malaysian biodiversity information system, and also a member of Asia-Pacific Association of Medical Toxicology, Ipo, Medicine, Ipo Emergency Medicine Society, and also uh, the member of College of Emergency Physician. Okay. Our second speaker is Paul Finney. He is a professor of medicine from Head of Department of Medicine in, and also a director of Ramati Body Poison Center in Thailand. He is a committee member of the Royal College of Physicians of Thailand, a present counsellor of the Medical Council of Thailand and the Head of Department of Medicine. He is also a fellow of the American College of Medical Toxicology and uh, currently a uh, president of the Ramati Body Poison Center. Okay. And also he is involved in multiple journals and also uh, publications locally and also internationally. Third, Dr. Noah Ashikin uh, is graduated with MBBS from University of Adelaide, South Australia in 1999 and obtained her Master of Pathology from UKM in 2008. And due to her strong interest in clinical toxicology, she underwent subspecialty training and also area of special interest in clinical toxicology in Hong Kong, Poison, in Poison Information Center in 2012. <clears throat> she has been working in pathology department, Hospital Kuala Lumpur as a chemical pathologist since 2008. And currently, she is the head of drug and of toxicology unit of Department of Pathology in HKL. She is also a member of our Asia Pacific Association of Medical Toxicology, College of Pathologists, and Academy of Medicine Malaysia, Malaysian Association of Clinical Biochemists, and a Postgraduate Society of HKL. She also has been actively involved in the postgraduate training of chemical pathology in Malaysia and has been invited to speak in seminars and conference locally and also internationally. Okay, last but not least, our distinguished speaker, Prof. Eileen McLeod-Mott. Uh, she is a doctor of public health in University uh, Philippines of Manila. Currently, she is an associate professor of Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology of College of Medicine, UP Manila, and also a senior consultant and lecturer of University Philippines in National Poison and Management and Control Center. She is also an affiliate professor in Institute of Herbal Medicine, National Institute of Health, uh, UP Manila, and she is a graduate program coordinator in Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology in UP Manila, <clears throat> and a biosafety officer in a Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology. And last not but least, she also a bioanalytical and toxicology laboratory of Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology. Okay. Other than that, she also a member of peer reviewer of Acta Medica Filipina and an editorial board of Biomi Science Journals and a member of International Advisory Board of Biomi Science Journals and an editorial board of Natural Products and Biotechnology Journal. 
Okay, now uh, we'll have a short opening speech uh, by our project uh, uh, advisor, Dr. Amirudin Sanib, our emergency physician of Hospital Chancellor Tunku Moris. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good morning to all the participants and panelists. Um, first of all, thank you uh, for all the panelists, Dr. Ruth Sabrina from Malaysia, uh, Prof. Winai Wana Nukulul from, the, from Thailand, uh, Dr. Nor Ashikin Osman from Malaysia, and Prof. Aileen Yabis uh, from Philippines for participating in this uh, webinar uh, with the topic of clinical analytical, uh, and, clinical and analytical toxicology. So um, basically, this uh, um, this emergency medicine seminar series has been uh, uh, has been uh, has, is is redone uh, for every year for almost uh, four years from now, uh, and uh, it's a very good uh, webinar which is uh, for uh, toxicology and toxicology, uh, and the the. The aim for this webinar is to improve our knowledge and to update our knowledge regarding the uh, toxicology and toxicology. Uh, this webinar will be held uh, every week uh, in September, uh, except for the fifth week of September, and will be held on every Thursday. So thank you for participating uh, in this webinar. Uh, okay, so uh, next we will start with our first presenter as I already uh, introduced previously. So Dr. Ruth Sabrina with her topic of updates in pesticide poisoning. Uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Ruth. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning uh, to all of the uh, committee members of EMSS, um, uh, speakers of week one uh, webinar, um, and also all the participants uh, for today, today's session. So uh, as uh, we mentioned before, I'm Sabrina from uh, Hospital Raja Pemansi Bainon, emergency physician with a uh, SIG in uh, clinical toxicology. So uh, I would rather uh, actually uh, share uh, the knowledge and experience that I have rather than teaching. Uh, so uh, when we talk about pesticides uh, poisoning, there are a lot actually. Uh, within this half uh, an hour, We'll try to see whether we can cover all or actually a uh, part of it, right? So uh, pesticides, uh, what uh, we have known about pesticides is that it is uh, any agent that is intended for prevent preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating any pest, okay? When we talk about uh, pesticides, there are a lot of types of uh, pesticides by its function whether it is actually insecticides, herbicides, rodenticides, and other things such as uh, actually uh, plant growth regulators, uh, repellents, and etc. So uh, in this uh, slide, I would like to highlight, uh, like in Malaysia, the, pestic the pesticides that are commonly uh, encountered by us is still uh, like organophosphates, carbamates, pyrethroids, and pyrethrins, uh, paraquat, glyphosate or glypho uh, glyphosinate, and also uh, occasionally rodenticides are poisoning, uh, which are anticoagulants, uh, either it's a warfarin or superwarfarin, uh, zinc phosphide, and uh, uh, very rarely tetramine uh, because it is uh, illegal to be imported in Malaysia, by the way. Uh, what have we known so far? Uh, from the BMG Open Journal, uh, published by our counterpart in Malaysia National Poison Center. They have published uh, the Journal of Evaluation of Types of Poisoning Exposure Costs managed by them uh, for a 10-year period. Uh, it is a retrospective review to see what are the most common uh, poisoning that are uh, consulted to them for the past 10 years. And from this chart, we know that actually the pharmaceutical agent is the number one, followed by the household or leisure uh, products and also pesticides. With regards to the pesticides poisoning cases uh, that referred to them, uh, so these are the, um, uh, uh, I mean, the types of pesticides that have been consulted. is still uh, within those 10-year uh, period, 
is still herbicides is the most uh, commonly uh, uh, poison uh, poison cases that being consulted, followed by insecticides, and then other than that is rodenticide and also household insecticides, right? So um, this is the list of common pesticide poisoning cases uh, referred to our National Poison Center within those uh, nine to 10 years period up to 2014. Um, uh, the majority is still uh, the one that I have mentioned before uh, based on the classes. Okay? Uh, we know that actually the WHO had actually uh, come up with recommendation classification of pesticides by hazard and they are uh, it is classified by uh, 1a 1b 2 and also class 3 and um, uh, and also class 4 basically uh, the lesser the classification the extreme hazardous uh, it is okay uh, where uh, does the does the classification exist in our um, our uh, product, uh, our insecticides product that that being sold um, in the market or at stores. So it is actually been mentioned at the lower part. So you can see over here uh, uh, and uh, to see whether uh, it is actually hazardous or uh, reduced hazard or not. So for this one, for example, it is a class uh, four, uh, and uh, this one uh, is class two. So we can know uh, the hazardous uh, um, classification on the uh, product label itself. So uh, there are also lists uh, that is available uh, based on classification. What are the types of pesticides that are really extremely hazardous uh, and etc. Okay. For Malaysia, uh, this is one of the website uh, that we are frequently uh, go to, which is actually the website of the Department of Agriculture, whereby uh, in this website, uh, we can actually know uh, what kind of uh, pesticides uh, that is uh, encountered in our uh, country. So normally the list uh, they provided to us in Excel form, uh, we can actually download the list and it is updated um, uh, quite frequently. Okay. So uh, our problem basically, basically in Malaysia is that of the unregistered pesticides, right? So when there are unregistered pesticides or whether the pesticide is banned uh, and uh, we don't know the toxicity of the pesticides and when the info is not reliable or not available, it may lead to Sorry. severe poisoning. Actually classified under uh, organophosphates, carbamates, pyrethrin and pyrethroids, organochlorines, others, right? The common uh, insecticides uh, in Malaysia particularly is still organophosphate. These are the examples of organophosphate that we commonly encounter in Malaysia, which is which are malathion and also chlorpyrifos. Okay. The history of organophosphate is that it is a first potent synthetic organophosphate that was synthesized in 1854. And it is further developed in the uh, 1940s for chemical warfare, uh, which is actually the nerve agents in World War II. It was introduced to replace DDT initially and believed to be better, but the toxicity, however, was more severe. So uh, the organophosphate is actually is chemical uh, esters of a phosphate compound, which is actually poorly soluble in water. It is lipophilic. Uh, it get redistributed from the fat stores, causing prolonged symptoms uh, in certain copies. And it can complicate with uh, intermediate syndrome. It's well absorbed from the lungs, GI, uh, skin, mucous membranes, and conjunctiva. So, we have got a lot of pesticides. We have got uh, uh, one of it is insecticides. And we have got under the insecticides, we have got the organophosphates. And we have a, a few types of organophosphates. So that is how complicated this is. Okay. So there are a few types of OP, whether it is phosphate compound, phosphothionate, phosphorothionate, phosphonate, and phosphoramides. So these are the um, um, chemical structures. 
So the thing about the uh, different kind of uh, organophosphate is the rate of aging uh, that are different within the dimethyl, for example, and also diethyl. Dimethyl, uh, dimethyl actually age faster compared to diethyl, right? What is aging? Aging is particularly the dealkalization uh, de of uh, acetylcholinesterase OP compound that cause it uh, to be irreversibly, uh, irreversibly reversed with the antidote. Okay. So uh, the mechanism of action for organophosphate is that uh, it's inhibit acetylcholinesterase and also butyl, uh, butylcholinesterase uh, at the particularly um, the peripheral uh, NMJ, uh, the uh, nervous system, and also central system. So uh, the toxicity is caused by the excessive acetylcholine and uncontrolled parasympathetic predominance. So basically, uh, the pathophysiology is that it inhibits the acetylcholinesterase, leading to accumulation of acetylcholine at the synapses. And excessive acetylcholine uh, at the mascarinic receptors causing the, our dumbbell syndrome and uh, excessive acetylcholine uh, at the nicotinic receptors leading to, the, for example, convulsions and also tremors. Okay. Uh, we are familiar with our plan of management, uh, for example, in uh, OP poisoning to watch out for uh, the polygenic toxidromes and we normally will write down the mnemonics of what are the Cholinergic and also mascarinic toxidrome, right? So basically, the mnemonic, either dumbbells or sludge, are uh, actually reflecting the cholinergic, but, but we, when uh, it comes to the dumbbells, for example, it also includes uh, the nicotinic part as well, right? So uh, again, uh, a repetitive one. Uh, but uh, having said that, please do not forget to watch out for the nicotinic. Uh, signs and symptoms as well. For example, muscle twitching, attorney, muscle weakness, and also paralysis, seizures, and also CNS depression. For the pattern of OP toxicities, uh, we can divide it into three, uh, which is from the acute cholinergic effect uh, that affect our mascarinic, nicotinic, and also central nervous system. Um, if not treated uh, effectively, the patient can actually progress to intermediate syndrome. And if the patient presented to us in delayed, uh, in, in delayed manner, so uh, the patient can also develop the uh, OP-induced uh, delayed neuropathy or neuropsychological effect. Okay. Uh, a bit of intermediate syndrome. It is first described in 1987 by Sinayake and Karali Deep. So basically, it occurs after the initial symptoms of cholinergic excess has resolved, typically from 24 to 96 hours after an apparently well-treated cholinergic crisis. It is characterized by respiratory paralysis, proximal or truncal, and also neck flexor muscle weaknesses, decreased deep tendon reflexes, and motor cranial nerve palsies. Uh, basically, no associated uh, sensory deficits, EMG, might, of be, might be of help. Right. So the diagnostic testing for OP uh, poisoning, um, uh, basically we can send for plasma cholinesterase, whether it's pseudo or butyl cholinesterase. Uh, the level of more than 500 international units or more than 10% usually is not severe, but bear in mind uh, different OP got uh, different effects. So some, some of the OP can cause uh, the plasma cholinesterase to be very low, uh, but the effect might be minimal. Right, uh, and uh, we also can measure RBC cholinesterase uh, that might reflect the acetylcholinesterase in the nervous system more. But uh, in Malaysia, for example, we do not have the measurement of RBC cholinesterase, and uh, they are also uh, described as uh, uh, having technical difficulty with storage and testing of the RBC cholinesterase, and uh, we do not uh, have the tests uh, available in our hospital. Right. These are not the same. Um, there are rival patterns of toxicity. Um, the animal LD50 are not predictive. Uh, as I said, different OPs has different response to treatment. 
and the pseudocholinesterase stress level may not be predictive in some OPs. And sometimes uh, the cause of uh, signs and symptoms uh, is complicated with additional toxicity. Example, with the solvent contents in oligophosphate poisonings. So when we talk about uh, decontamination, first of all is protecting our staff. And it is suggested to have limited number of staff managing the patients. Um, and PPE is uh, of utmost importance. And if you can manage in a negative pressure ventilation, it is really good. Um, and then uh, to, for us to prevent further exposure by removing all of the clothing, uh, wash with copious amounts of soap and water of the patient's body. And with regards to the evidence of MDAC, multi-dose activated charcoal versus no charcoal at all, uh, it shows not much difference in terms of benefit. Right? Uh, the hallmark is always a good supportive management with resuscitation and handling uh, the airway and breathing uh, effectively, right? So we might need to uh, select appropriate uh, RSI agent for this patient should we have to intubate the patient. And also, um, please set to at least two large barbarnula because patient tends to lose fluids, right? And if we do ECG, we can see, um, we might see prolonged QTC or any types of uh, ventricular uh, dysrhythmia that actually have been described and been studied in a few, um, in a few studies uh, overseas, the association of OP with uh, ECG changes. And also uh, if the patient presented with seizures um, to give benzodiazepines and really to give a timely uh, antidotes, which are the atropine and plus minus pariloxin. So with regards to atropine, uh, the question is, do I need to give? How much? Do I give it straight away? What are the problems with too much atropine and how do I know? Basically, the atropine is derived from the atropa melodina plants. Okay? If atropine, when the patient is having dumbbells, so um, normally, we will start with uh, 0 0.5 to 1 milligram. And if it's not improving, we will actually giving the atropine in a manner of double the dose. Okay? If you have a given 5.5, .5, then it's 1, 2, 4, uh, 8, 16, and etc. Okay? And then if we want to uh, give the infusion dose, it is about 20% of the loading dose per hour. Uh, different toxicologists will start the infusion dose differently, right? Uh, and it is when we start the atropine, okay, uh, there it is. Uh, it requires meticulous frequent re-evaluation and titration. And the aim is to reduce the lung and cardiac toxicity, right? Uh, do not use the pupillary size and heart rate as the endpoint for adequate atropinization. And um, the patient should be kept well atropinized for at least five to seven days, depends on what OP uh, the patient ingested and the volume. This is the study from the Journal of Medical Toxicology in 2012 uh, showing um, the, uh, uh, the RCT of atropine boldus injection versus incremental boldus plus infusion. So it is actually uh, uh, from this chart, uh, we can see that uh, in conventional bolus protocol, the time to atropinize is much more longer compared to uh, we give atropine in a titrated doubling protocol manner. Okay. We have got atropine chart. Uh, we have got the uh, score of uh, atropinization and also to assess whether there are any atropine overdoses. So basically how we should use the chart is that uh, we, will, uh, so we will actually uh, accumulate the score one plus or two. And if actually the score is less than four means that it is inadequate doses of atropine. If the score is between four to six, meaning that it's adequate. Uh, if more than six means uh, you might be uh, overdosing the atropine treatment for the patient. Uh, in one of the studies by Edelston and, uh, and uh, Nick Buckley et al. Uh, in 2008, it is mentioned that tachycardia is not a contraindication to atropine. 
the pupils will form the dilate. This, is, this sign is not a useful endpoint for initial atropine treatment because a delay exists before maximum effect. However, very dilated pupils are an indicator of atropine toxicity in the patient uh, who is on inf uh, infusion particularly. Okay. The problems with uh, atropine toxicity is that uh, the patient might have a severe tachycardia, complicated with rhabdomyolysis, uh, the patient might have agitation and delirium, or it might pose a risk of MI in elderly. So that's, that is why severe frequent assessment is very important when the patient is on atropine, particularly atropine infusion. How about pralidoxine? Right. Um, pralidoxine basically liberates the acetylcholinesterase from binding to OP, permitting enzymatic activities. And uh, it is believed to produce substantial and moderate uh, red cell acetylcholinesterase reactivation in a poison patient by diethyl and dimethyl compound. Okay. Um, it is uh, actually required, or uh, the indication is when the patient uh, presented with suspect of confirmed exposure to opiate insecticide with uh, neuromuscular weakness or si when we have got significant atropine requirement. These are the doses. Um, the optimal doses regimen is still unknown. Okay. Uh, we may give a uh, uh, bolus. Uh, I mean, I mean, uh, we may give an uh, initial uh, loading dose followed by uh, maintenance. Do not give bolus. Okay. Uh, but does it work? Okay. Despite WHO recommendations, no proper clinical evidence uh, have been conduct conducted. Okay. Uh, but based on um, um, description from studies, uh, it shows that no evidence that pradiloxine improves survival or reduce needs for intubation in patients with OP insecticide poisoning. These are all investigational treatment that may be of use, but uh, personally speaking, I haven't used any of these. Of course, we have used the magnesium sulfate to correct any electrolyte imbalance, for example, hypomagnesemia or sodium bicarb if it is concomitantly uh, related to the uh, metabolic acidosis, right? But not purely for the OP poisoning. Okay. So for OP poisoning, the summary is that if the patient is not intubated, this uh, keep the patient in left lateral position while clearing the airway to prevent aspiration. Um, consider early intubation and ventilation for severe poisoning and to start the atropine as soon as possible and ensure adequate atropinization with early, uh, with early and good supportive care that might improve the survival outcome. Okay, we'll go to the next uh, 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 insecticide, which are carbamates that are also commonly encountered in Malaysia. Uh, it has a similar action and the toxicities as organophosphate, but the acetylcholinesterase will not age, right? The toxicities usually resolve in 24 hours with supportive treatment, um, and atropine uh, might be indicated for the cholinergic toxicity, and pradidoxine usually not required in case of confirmed carbofurin uh, or carbamix uh, poisoning or ingestion. This is, the, this is actually the difference uh, between um, the pathophysiology symptoms and the requirement of atropine toxicity, uh, whether uh, the compound is uh, 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 aging or not, and whether uh, pradidoxine is actually indicated or not. We go to the next one, which is actually the pyrethrin and pyrethrox under insecticides. Okay, this is the chrysanthemum uh, flower. Right. Uh, pyrethrin is the first pyrethrin extracted from the chrysanthemic acid and pyrethrin acid. Um, it has a knockdown effect, priority effect on insects, and um, uh, it causes a dermal toxicity, even a low penetration low, even lower, slow penetration with rapid metabolism. Uh, basically, the mechanism of action is it blocks the sodium panel uh, with prolonged depolarization, hence, and uh, also blocks the chloride channels that enhance the CNS toxicity and the patient might present that to us with a seizure. Um, toxicity may resemble OP overdose. Um, type 1 usually uh, unlikely to cause a systemic toxicity, whereby type 2 is the one that uh, can cause 
uh, paresthesia, celebration, also of the dizziness, vasculation, seizures, and etc. Body management uh, or decontamination, AC contraindication if if actually the diluent of pyrethroid contain, contains petroleum solvent, uh, it is basically entirely supportive and symptomatic, whereby we have got no antidotes. And probably you, know, you will need benzodiazepines for seizures and also the tremors. You go to the last inside the insecticides, which is the organic chlorine. Organic chlorines, uh, for example, in Malaysia, we have uh, seen lesser and lesser. Okay, so these are the examples of organic chlorines. Uh, it is highly lipid soluble with a uh, redistribution to fat stores and it is well absorbed already inhalationally and transdermally. Um, well, uh, when we talk about DDT, it's poorly absorbed transdermally because it requires hydrocarbon to, dis to dissolve, right? Okay. So toxicity is by interfering with neuronal repolarization or prolonged depolarization causing in hyperexcitability excitability of our CNS and it may sensitize the myocardium to endogenous our endogenous catecholamines causing dysrhythmia and it can reduce the seizure threshold and blocks the gamma receptors. Okay. So basically uh, the manifestation commonly seen is seizures and uh, also uh, hyperthermia secondary to increased muscle activities and central mechanisms. The management includes uh, donning proper PPE and decontaminate, external decontamination of the patient. Uh, there's no uh, specific antidotes and we can treat seizures with benzo. If uh, actually the seizure is very calcitrant, we can use barbiturates or propofol infusion with neuromuscular blockade if necessary. Um, if patient is really hypothermic, uh, we should uh, institute a uh, cool uh, or cool the patient uh, aggressively because if not, then the subsequent complications might occur. So uh, all in all, uh, it's a good supportive care, right? So we have got around uh, five to 10 minutes. I will highlight a bit about the herbicides. The herbicides that we encounter in Malaysia is uh, particularly the paraquat, glyphosate, and also glufosinate and also others. Um, having said that, Although the paraquat is being banned in Malaysia, we still encounter cases by cases because uh, it is actually uh, it's still available in uh, the grocery shop and etc. So, uh, but uh, lately the glyphosate and also glyphosate uh, types of herbicides is in, is uh, cases are actually increasing in trend. What is at least right? So for paraquat. Uh, this is the example of the uh, bottle that we uh, grabbed from one of the patients that presented to us. The mechanism of toxicity is still uh, actually um, uh, lipid peroxidation, right? So uh, this complex uh, 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 diagram uh, is showing the ultimate uh, oxidative stress uh, with lipid peroxidation that happened uh, to our cells, okay? Uh, so causing the cells to be necrosis, inflamed, and fibrosis, particularly if we are talking about the pneumocyte cells. In paraquat poisoning, the features including corrosive effects on the mouth, pharynx, and esophagus, and the early deaths are from cardiac effect with shock, and the late deaths are usually from pulmonary fibrosis and respiratory failure, uh, with uh, commonly renal and hepatic dysfunction as well. Um, we can classify into mild, severe, and fulminant uh, based on the approximate amount ingested. But usually when the patient comes to us with a poisoning, um, even the patient itself cannot really quantify uh, and uh, the, whether the patient is telling us the true story or not is different story at all. Okay, So the management includes decontamination of the patient, uh, the healthcare need to wear PPE, right? And decontaminate the patient with, uh, using the soap and water. And uh, do not administer, administer supplemental oxygen unless the patient is severely hypoxic. If the patient is severely hypoxic, we know that actually um, uh, the patient uh, is really ill. So um, uh, if you give the oxygen, it might actually um, 
precipitate more of the uh, superoxide free radical oxygen. Okay. Replace fluids and electrolyte losses. And lavage is actually uh, quite contraindicated for paraquat induced uh, because of paraquat induced corrosive injury. And charcoal, if the patient presented early, but most of the time the patient will have a risk of the airway because patient might have a GIT um, uh, sign and symptoms, right? And uh, other things like uh, charcoal have a perfusion, uh, pulse therapy, and NAC has a doubtful efficacy, I would say. For glyphosate, this is the one that we have in Malaysia. Okay. Uh, the toxicity is usually because besides the effect of the glyphosate, the toxicity is, is because of the uh, surfactant component as well. For example, the polyoxyethylene amine, okay, POEA, which is actually uh, give the corrosive effect to the patient. And um, uh, ingestion of uh, more than 150 ml of glyphosate solution, 36%. Can cause a severe multi organ toxicity. Okay? And basically, what are the patient's presentation to us is that the patient might present with a GIT sign symptoms, mucous membrane irritations, abdominal pain, diarrhea, and uh, also other target organ damage uh, presentation like ARDS, seizure, cardiac respiratory arrest, and uh, death. Right? So, management is still decontamination with uh, stabilization of the airway and breathing and supportive treatment. We might, need to give, uh, we might need to do a hemodialysis in severe acidotic and HI patient. With regards to rodenticide, the one that we have in, uh, in Malaysia is still warfarin and superwarfarin. Uh, occasionally zinc phosphide, rarely tetramine. Okay, so uh, warfarin uh, is like over here, uh, the King Kong Red Killer, uh, just a, one of the brand name and super warfarin uh, because we still uh, have the mother tincture uh, solution uh, that are actually uh, not registered uh, uh, that we have in Malaysia. Okay? Basically, it's inhibit the generation of active form of vitamin K1, affecting the activation of protein factor 2, 7, 9, 10 and resulting in coagulopathy. Right? So, the pharmacokinetics is that it inhibits the vitamin K regeneration immediately, but the anticoagulant effect that we'll see for the patient is delayed until pre-existing anticoagulation factors are consumed. Uh, it is actually uh, true for warfarin, but when the patient actually ingested super warfarin, the effect might be earlier, uh, might, might be earlier, right? So, uh, most exposures, there are no clinical effects. So that's why the patient presented to us uh, with a normal NR. So we can actually uh, discharge, but we have to follow up the patient uh, to repeat the INR uh, level and to see whether the patient will need any uh, vitamin K treatment or not. Right? Uh, as I said, the paramount important is for us to check for coagulation profile. And if the patient ingested a lot of uh, vitamin K, uh, decontamination uh, might be needed, needed. And the antidote is a vitamin K1, also known as phytomenagian. Okay. Please do not give prophylactic vitamin K1 okay, unless there are clinical or laboratory evidence of coagulopathy for the following reasons. Right? Okay. If you give prophylactic vitamin K1 before you see any coagulopathy, it will make subsequent follow up of the patient and interpretation of lab results difficult. Okay? And it may give a false reassurance with a subsequent normal clotting profile. Right? So these are the charts uh, that we use uh, in our guide book. Okay? So this is the antidotes uh, that is available in our ED which is the vitamin K1, phytomenagian. Okay. Uh, vitamin K therapy, if you want to use it, you can use oral or intravenous. But intravenous actually spread for the uh, massive uh, bleeding, right? So regarding tetramine, um, right. Tetramine is extremely toxic. We have got one or two cases being consulted to us, uh, again, through a, uh, through a, a pretty unregistered product, okay? has a very long half-life. The Im most important thing about tetramine is it causes retractable seizures, okay? 
and uh, whereby all your anti-epileptics uh, might not be working in a confirmed tratamine cases, and you might need to use, um, uh, you might need to deliver good supportive care and also uh, other antidotes that is available, for example, uh, uh, pyridoxine, uh, hydrospyridoxine treatment for the uh, tratamine uh, poisoning. So that's about it from me. Uh, I hope uh, uh, it may add to your knowledge. Uh, any question you may ask uh, in the Q&A session later on. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Ruth Sabrina, for your wonderful speech. Uh, I think all of us, Jane, a lot of new knowledge from a uh, lecture just now. Okay, so uh, we'll move on to our next topic, which is general emergency approach to clinical toxicology uh, by Prof. Vinay Wanakul uh, from Thailand. Thank you. Good day, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for having me join this conference. Today, we will discuss how to approach or making diagnosis of poisoning in the emergency setting. In our daily practice, when we get the patient in the emergency department, the step will start from stabilization, evaluation, and make a plan for treatment of the patient. Stabilization is a step that I'm sure that all of us practice very well every day. I will not go through it. Today, we will pay more attention on evaluation. I will not go through it. The aim of evaluation is uh, to reach at least uh, two answer after we get the information from physical examination, history, and laboratory tests. The first is that, what is the diagnosis? The second is how serious and or uh, how urgent the condition is. At the same as a, another illness, we will get this important information by taking uh, history, physical examination, and select the appropriate test which help us to establish the diagnosis. In history taking, besides general identification, patient occupation, hobbies, and recreative activities are also important. This is because they might give us a hint of some poison. For poison exposure, if the patient is able to tell what poison they expose, it will be very helpful for us, however, this information is not totally reliable. So besides what kind of the poison they expose, we ask for dose, route of exposure, and also the time or duration of exposure. These three information is important because it is a factor that determine the degree or severities of poisoning. We also ask for the circumstance of exposure, such as whether it is intentional, unintentional, or accidental exposure. This information will be used for secondary, secondary prevention after the treated patient. In the patient who cannot give uh, history, we should ask for witness at uh, the scene. And we also ask for the clinical cause after exposure. That will be help us to uh, make the diagnosis accurately. However, there are some pitfalls about the history that we should aware. The first one is the reliability of the history. Although we get the information directly 
from the patient. But sometimes the, the history from the patient is not totally correct or wrong. It may or may not uh, be from the intention of the patient to give us that wrong information. For example, if the patient who are accidental exposure, he may never know that he are exposed to the poison and got poisoning. So he will not tell us about uh, the exposure of the poison. At the same time, some substance or some toxic substance, the same name may not be the same poison. And in the opposite, a poison may have different names in uh, different places or different time. For example, the substance of abuse, the same slang name in the different place or in the different time. It might be the different substances. Or uh, the snake in, uh, in one region might have different name from the other region that we should aware. So many times that we frustrate from this unknown or unfamiliar chemical substance. At this time, if we got this problem, we might uh, use the searching from the internet for find out what kind of the substance or the poison it is. But if we cannot do so, just ignore this name and try to make the diagnosis from the other information such as clinical uh, manifestation or laboratory test. Physical examination, the most important part is vital sign because vital sign uh, not only tell us the how stable the patient is, but it also imply the disturbance of autonomic uh, nervous system dysfunction. Many poison, when they affect the patient, they might disturb the autonomic nervous system that cause tachycardia or bradycardia, hypotension or hypertension, something like that. And this is a footprint that enable us to uh, find out the diagnosis of the patient. Besides the uh, vital size, we might look for the local uh, involvement or the systemic effect uh, from the poisoning. Many laboratory tests are helpful in our practice. Right now, we have a point of care tests and also a basic laboratory tests that will be get the uh, result and help us uh, timely. However, when we thinking about poisoning, many physicians uh, will ask for the specific toxicological lab by sending serum, plasma, urine for uh, analysis. But uh, in general, the tox lab is not available in many places uh, or sometimes uh, the lead time before we get the results is too long uh, for us to uh, manage a patient. So we still have to depend on this point of care test or uh, basic lab. The example of the basic lab that uh, can help us is uh, ECG. In this picture, uh, the QIS complex in the ECG is quite wide especially in the terminal phase. And also we found a tall R wave in the AVR lead. If we found this EKG, uh, it will suggest that the patient have an effect from uh, sodium channel block. And uh, the substance that cause sodium channel block will include tricyclic antidepressant in a toxic dose, antipsychotics, and uh, the antiarrhythmic drug, especially the class 1A. 
all the plain film like this picture, you can find that there are several uh, rod shaped hyperdensity in the large intestine. So this is a picture of the patient who are body packers. This peripheral blood smear show basophilic stripping. If we have the patient come in with acute colic pain with a normal uh, physical examination uh, on the abdomen, but also anemic, the blood smear here will suggest late poisoning. In the case of uh, paraquat poisoning, because the early phase of the paraquat, they might have only the local effect, such as a corrosive effect. Uh, sometimes it's quite difficult from the history to differentiate between paraquat and other uh, herbicide or caustic injection. And also uh, it's quite difficult for the physician uh, to estimate how severe of the paraquat poisoning in the patient. Uh, the paraquat test kit that uh, give us at uh, the time that we test will help us for uh, the diagnosis as well as uh, predict the severities of paraquat poisoning. A technique to make diagnosis is pattern recognition. If we have a patient who have a typical uh, pattern of illness, it will be easier for the physician to recognize and make the diagnosis of that illness. For example, if we have a ladies come in with fever, with chill, and dysuria, physical examination review tenderness at costal vertebral angle. We will easier to make diagnosis as acute pyelonephritis. The more common of the illness we find, the easier for the physician to recognize that illness. In clinical toxicology, pattern recognition technique is also used in our practice as well. The tool for pattern recognition in toxicology is toxic drone. So what is a toxic drone? Toxic drone or toxic syndrome is a combination of sign and symptom which are caused by the toxic effect of poison. Generally, they are pathophysiologic changes due to the effect of poison in the whole body. Because toxidome is a classic clinical feature, recognition of toxidome will enable physician to rapidly detect the suspect etiology and help to focus the differential diagnosis to those few persons who have similar effects. Before we go to the uh, common toxic drone, I'd like to remind about two types of neurotransmitter. The first one is acetylcholine, which are two receptor, masculine receptor and nicotinic receptor. Nicotinic receptor are located on neuromuscular junction and masculine receptor are mainly uh, on parasympathetic system. And also in the sweat gan. And the other uh, receptor is adrenergic receptor that are on the sympathetic system. Now we have two toxic drones in this slide sympathomimetic and anti cortic toxic drone. These two toxic drones, they produce quite a similar clinical manifestation. They can cause tachycardia, hypertension, hyperactive, or even agitation, psychosis, uh, mydrasis, or dilated pupils. 
the difference between simple magnetics and anti-corrigics is sweating. For simple magnetic toxic drone, the patient uh, might have diaphoresis, but for the anti-corrigic, the patient have a dry skin and mucosa. If the diagnosis is sympatho magnetic toxic drone, uh, the etiology will be include amphetamine and derivatives, cocaine, withdrawal of syndrome of ethanol and uh, sedative hypnotic drugs, and also serotonin syndrome. But if the patient has agitation but dry skin and mucosa, Diagnosis will be anti coronagic and the uh, differential diagnosis will be antihistamine, anti coronagics, toxic mushroom, uh, datura, dicyclic antidepressant, and antipsychotics. The coronagic toxic drone are opposite from the previous ones. This toxic drone, we have two subtypes that is masculine choragic toxic drone and nicotinic choragic toxic drone. In the masculine toxic drone, the patient will have bradycardia, hypertension, coma, diarrhea, sweating, salivation, diaphoresis, and small pupil. But if it is nicotinic, they will cause tachycardia, hypertension, muscle fit, uh, muscle fasciculation, and finally, muscle paralysis and weakness. If we find both muscarinic and nicotinic toxic drone in the same time, the differential diagnosis will be poisoning from drug in dementia, such as donepicil, uh, galantamine, or drug used in mycinic gravis, such as Edophonium and pyridostigmine, and also organophosphorus and carbamate insecticide. But if we found only masculine effect, we have to uh, thinking about the toxic mushroom and also some PL choragic drugs such as beta nicole. In patients who develop coma, small respiratory rate, or sometimes amnic, hypotension, and small pupil, the diagnosis will include several types of opioid and opiates. And we also have to think about phenobarbital, isopropanol, methyl dopa, chronidine, salicine, and uh, veterinary anesthetic agent, and also the lesion in porn and cerebellum. In this toxic drone, naloxone will be a therapeutic agent for rule in and rule out of opioid poisoning. Beside the pattern recognition, the other two is suspicious. In any patient, will present with multiple system involvement of unknown etiology, and we have already excluded the common cause of that illness. Poisoning should be suspect until proof otherwise. Many kinds of poisoning, they have a clinical presentation that similar to some of the systemic effects. So I call it poisoning is an imitator. For example, a patient come in with stroke but do not have a cardiovascular risk. We have to think that it might be caused by methamphetamine or cocaine. Patient with uh, fever and alteration of consciousness. Besides encephalitis, Neuroleptic malignant syndrome should be aware, especially in the patient who took antipsychotic. Patient who have a total paralysis and sometimes the condition is like a brain dead. Uh, 
the differential diagnosis will be total paralysis from neurotoxic snake bite or botulism. Patient will have an acute psychosis. It might be intoxication from anti-chorotic agent such as atropine or taking datura. The patient will come in with chest pain, acute coronary syndrome, especially in the case that without uh, cardiovascular risk. For example, young adult, we might have to aware that it might cause by methamphetamine or cocaine. Patient who have hepatitis, it may be intoxicated from paracetamol or mushroom containing amatoxin. In the patient who have generalized weakness and have a normal gap metabolic acidosis with hypokalemia. This feature is tubular uh, acidosis, renal tubular acidosis type 1. Besides this disease, it might cause by uh, toluene intoxication in the setting of glue sniffing. Or the patient come in with hemolysis. It may be caused by drugs such as Dapsone, herbicide such as Provenil, or the fava beans. The patient with salicylate poisoning, especially chronic salicylate poisoning, it mimics sepsis. So uh, I would like to finish my talk with this algorithm. If the patient suspect poisoning, we first will ask that whether we can identify the poison. Can the patient give us the information about the poison they expose? If yes, we will not jump to the diagnosis. We still have to check whether it is compatible with the clinical of toxicity of that poisoning. If yes, we surely make the diagnosis and uh, proceed for the treatment. But if we cannot identify the poison or the clinical syndrome are not compatible with the history, we have to check or make the diagnosis based on the clinical manifestation, toxic drome, or more laboratory tests to confirm or even consult the poison center. If we do that, we can make the diagnosis. We go to the treatment, but if not, the only way that we can do is supportive treatment, follow and observe for the new sign and symptom frequently. And sometimes the new symptom will suggest us for the diagnosis. But if not, we still uh, can treat the patient with this supportive care and mostly we can successfully save the patient. So I will finish my talk at this slide and thank you very much for your attention. And I happy to respond for all your comment and question. Okay, thank you, Prof. Vinay, for his lecture. Uh, I'm sure all of us gained a lot of information from his lecture. So uh, next, we'll have a short break and we'll meet back at 9.45 a.m. Okay, welcome back, everyone, to our fourth uh, Emergency Medicine Scientific Seminar Series. Okay, so uh, next, I'd like to we continue with our next topic. Uh, updates in urine drug test in emergency department by Dr. No Ashikin Othman. Okay, so the floor is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good morning to all. I'm Dr. No Ashikin Othman, chemical pathologist from Hospital Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I'll be talking about urine drug test in the emergency department. I will give an overview of the purpose of drug of abuse testing, the principles, the utility, and the pitfalls of point-of-care TOCT screening method, 
And after understanding all this, we need to ask ourselves whether we do we really need that emergency drug screen. Urine drug screening has become the standard of care in many medical practice settings to assess compliance, to detect misuse, or to provide basis for medical or legal action. The implementation of the test has expanded to emergency department, primary care clinics, mental health facilities, pain management clinics, etc. Despite the convenience of the test, the limitation of the urine drug screening are many and must be understood by all clinicians, especially those who are ordering and interpreting the results, so that the resulting action are indicated and supported. The purpose of urine drug testing is to check for the presence of any drugs or their metabolites in a specimen obtained from a subject. It is used for the criminal justice purposes. It plays a role in facilitating the judicial sentence of a drug abuse in courts, drug surveillance programs of inmates who are detained under the custody of drug treatment centers. And in Malaysia, drugs Dangerous Drug Act 1952 is the major legislation in relation to drug control, together with the Drug Dependent Treatment and Rehabilitation Act 1983. It is also used in a workplace testing. So pre-employment and workplace drug testing, either as mandatory legislation or corporate commitment, as measure to improve safety within the workplace. It is also used in emergency medicine and clinical toxicology to evaluate the intoxicated patients and those with non-specific presentations such as altered mental status, seizure, or acute psychiatric symptoms. And also uh, to monitor compliance to prescribe drugs, abstinence from drugs in drug addiction clinic and pain management clinic. This is to provide effective, appropriate, and prompt treatment or supportive care. Urine has been and remained the mostly used body fluid specimen for routine drug testing because of the large specimen volume, relatively high drugs and metabolites concentration which allow a longer detection times, a non-invasive and the urine remains stable over time and can be frozen to maintain the integrity of the sample. The limitation is the adulteration and substitution or dilution is possible unless obtained under a direct observation. Screening method for drug testing can be either a dry test or a wet test. A dry test is a strip that is used in many POCT sites. It is a strip that impregnated with the dry reagents to which the specimen is added. Enzymatic immunoassay is the current standard method and it provides a rapid turnaround time because it is ability to manage the patient in, in a timely manner. The cost per test can be high unless there is a sufficient workload. The urine drug testing can be sent to the lab and the test is done in a liquid phase by automated and high throughput analyzer. It has a better quality control monitoring training, competency, and result interpretation. It has a longer turnaround time because the sample has to be sent to the lab for analysis and report generating. Any presumptive screening positive results may be subjected to confirmatory testing in order to eliminate false positive results that arise from cross activity. The technique used in the lab uh, gas chromatography mass spectrometry or liquid chromatography tender mass spectrometry which is highly specific and selective it, it is time consuming labor intensive and expensive tests uh, which is conducted by highly trained personnel so the users of POCT should know the pattern of drug use which drug tend to be prevalent in our region and attentive to a new substance use trends and emerging drugs. Drug testing panels should be based on drugs commonly used in a patient's geography to facilitate test result interpretation. The users of POCT should also know the pharmacological aspect of the drugs. They need to understand the drug metabolism, 
in the spectrum of analytes, drugs and metabolites detected by the device. We also need to know the technical aspect of the test system, the principles of the immunoassay, the cut-off of the test, the window of detection, the cross-reactivity, which is the interference from the drugs or metabolites that could affect the interpretation of results. This we can actually refer to the POCT package insert to determine the device capabilities. POCT device utilizes principles of immunoassay based on the principles of competitive binding and lateral flow chromatography. Drugs that may be present in the urine specimen compete against the drug conjugates for the binding sites of the specific antibody. During testing, a proportion of urine specimen migrates upward by capillary action. A drug, if absent or present below its cut of concentration, will not saturate the binding sites of the antibody. The immobilized antibody at the test line will react with the drug conjugate and a visible colored line will show up in the test line region and gives a negative result. The presence of a drug above the cut of concentration in the urine specimen will compete with the drug conjugate and will saturate all the binding sites for the antibody. The colored line will not generate in the test line region and the test result is positive. So why cutoff matters in drug testing? Cutoff values define the concentration needed to produce positive results for screening on immunoassay. You can look at the POCT package insert to look for the cutoff values. So the concentration, the, the cutoff value is the concentration below which a qualitative results is determined to be negative and above which the results is determined to be positive. So you can see from the fig figure here, a negative sample doesn't mean that it is a drug free. It, may, it might contain a drug at a concentration that is lower than the defined cutoff level. And where does this uh, cutoff values come from? Who actually decide the cutoff values? In US, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, SAMHSA, is an agency within the US Department of Health and Human Services. They are responsible for establishing the mandatory guideline for workplace drug testing program for federally regulated employees. And this guideline defines which drugs to be tested, what cutoff to be used to determine a positive versus negative results, and other collection criteria. And many non-SAMSA laboratories have chosen to follow SAMSA guideline. This includes companies performing pre-employment screening or ongoing employment screening, pain management clinician monitoring for patient compliance and treatment, or criminal justice program testing participants for drug of abuse. So these are the guidelines used uh, in the US. And if you look at the marijuana or metabolites, THC uh, cutoff, they use a 50 nanogram per meal for codeine and morphine. The cutoff level for screening is 2,000 nanogram per meal, and amphetamine, methamphetamine, MDMA, and MDA. The cutoff value for screening is 500 nanogram per meal. So Malaysia also have our own guideline. Um, this is a new guideline published in 2021. Uh, the guideline for drug of abuse testing in urine. Uh, the previous guideline was published in 2002. So this is the new version of the uh, guideline, uh, which was published in 2021. So in our guideline, um, the initial screening cutoff for opiates is 300 nanogram per mil. The cannabinoid is 50 nanogram per mil. The amphetamine type stimulant the amphetamine, methamphetamine, MDA, and MDMA is 1,000 nanogram per mil. So, different countries may set a different cutoff values. So, we have a different uh, cutoff for different countries, and this cutoff is meant for law enforcement drug testing purposes. So, it is not appropriate for clinical use, uh, for example, for medication adherence or addiction treatment. Because this cutoff may be too high to detect presence of a drug. So probably you need a lower cutoff values, which is more sensitive, 
especially when testing for medication adherence. For example, methadone and for monitoring patient on chronic opioid therapy. Yeah. So this lower cutoff is needed in order to minimize a false negative results. But in emergency department setting, the cutoff level used is acceptable because the patient presented to the ED are mostly in acute intoxication. So the level is 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 expected to be very high. Yeah. So lowering the cutoff concentration for clinical setting especially in the in ED setting, will also increase the number of cases of incidental drug positive findings. It means those that do not contribute to the clinical symptoms of the patient. Cutoff concentration may be subject to change as advanced in technology or other concentration warrant identification of substance and other concentration concentrations. This is taking into account the analytical technique performance of the assay to be used in the pharmacokinetics of the drugs involved. So there are actually changes um, in the cutoff um, in our guideline, in Malaysian guideline in 2021 compared to 22 guideline. Yeah. Drug tests are designed to detect whether a substance has been used within a particular window of time. Depending on the drugs, it may show up in the urine within a few hours or weeks after being, being ingested. And if we look at the table 2, there are a list of drugs with a length of time drugs of abuse can be detected in the urine. Yeah? So we need to understand that the detection time in urine will vary significantly based on multiple factors including uh, dose, elimination half-life, urine pH, urine dilution, frequency of use, and time of last use is important for result interpretation. Some drugs metabolize quickly and are detectable only a few hours after they are taken. However, the, re the metabolites remains in the urine at high enough concentration for an extended period of time. So only the metabolite is required for screening. For example, marijuana, the immunoassay designed to detect 11 non 9 carboxy delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, which is the major metabolite of marijuana found in the urine. For cocaine, the immunoassay for cocaine detects the presence of the major inactive metabolite excreted in the urine, benzoylelaginine, and heroin is metabolized to 6 monoacetylmorphine, 6 m, then to morphine. So this is a case of patients presented with a, a drugs with a longer detection window. A patient presented with tachycardia, altered mental status, and hypothermia. It was tested positive for benzoylaginine. There is a possibility of acute cocaine intoxication, but cocaine use can cause can cause positive results up to five days. So the current urgent clinical scenario could be due to other potential clinical conditions, for example, serotonin syndrome, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, sepsis, thyroidstorm, etc. So reliance on the results of urine drug may lead to misdiagnosis. So a positive result does not prove that the substance identified is the cause of the patient's clinical features. Where the immunoassay falls short, False positive and false negative results can occur at the screening stage mainly because of the cross activity uh, due to the sharing structural similarity and sharing common metabolites which can give a false, false positive results. And a false negative results can be due to a structural diversity of the common drugs within each class. Uh, the drugs may not share common metabolites and the therapeutic or, sub, or supra therapeutic doses may not exceed the detection threshold levels in the urine to be detected. So sharing structural similarity is one of the cause of false positive results. Immunoassay rely on the intrinsic ability of the developed antibody to bind to the unique three-dimensional structure of a drug molecule or class of drug molecule. And many therapeutic agents share structural similarities that make it difficult for the antibody-based assay to only detect its target compound or class of compound. 
and drug and drug metabolites that share structural similarities with the target compound may cross react with the antibodies used in the screening immunoassays and produce a positive VOGT test. And the degree of immunoassays specificity depends on the extent to which antibodies will bind specifically with the target compound while excluding structurally related compound across activity. So for example, amphetamine assays here share a same phenyl element based structure with other therapeutic agents and you can see that other drugs can also give a positive amphetamine test rate. The specificity of the POCT test can vary between manufacturers. Sharing common metabolites is also one of the reasons of a false positive results. Some drugs share common metabolites, for example, codeine and heroin are both metabolized to morphine. So the detection of morphine indicates that the person has been exposed to one of these opioids, but the result by itself cannot determine if the drug consumed was morphine, codeine or heroin. So positive results in POCT means there is a drug in the drug metabolites in the specimen. The patient may be exposed to the target substance, but the substance may not be responsible for the patient's clinical condition. Uh, it may be due to other reasons eh, that intake of illicit drugs due to cross activity. For example, if the patient is actually taking a prescribed or over the counter medication, or dietary causes, which can give a false positive results. So positive urine drug screen does not rule in that the patient's presentation is due to the drugs. Case number two is a 35-year-old man presented with central nervous system depression, meiosis and respiratory depression, complicated by hypoxia and hyperkemia. He was suspected to have an opiate overdose. The urine drug sip was negative for opiate, but uh, the trial of naloxone was given and subsequently he was recovered and we were able to obtain the medication history and he is chronically on methadone for pain. So you can see that the opiate can be classified into three categories, uh, either from opium, semi-synthetic or synthetic. And the antibodies used in standard opiate immunity target morphine-like molecule and best detect morphine and codeine. So modification to the chemical structure of this natural compound make it difficult to detect this modified compound using traditional opiate immunity. And some of the most abused prescription narcotics, including methadone, ozicodone, and tramadol, are frequently undetected due to their more synthetic nature. So drug of abuse not detected by routinely used urine drug tests because of the structural diversity of common drugs within each class. So it makes it difficult to develop a single antibody to detect all compounds of any particular class. So the standard opiate immunoassay show a moderate cross-reactivity with hydrocodone and hydromorphone, a poor cross-reactivity with oxycodone and osomorphone, and negligible to no cross-reactivity with fentanyl, mepidrine, methadone, and buprenorphine. So how to overcome this? We need a specific urine strip for a specific drug. So if a clinician, clinician who sees the patient just now see a negative opiate immunoassay and neglect to give him a naloxone, the mismanagement of the patient may result in harm. So gathering a history including medication history and physical assessment are more valuable in guiding medical management of the patient. How do we know which drugs is crossly act with the drug strip? Yeah? We need to look at the package instead. Yeah? Some of the drugs crossly act at a very high concentration. If you can see here, this is an example of promethazine uh, that it needs a higher concentration at 25,000 nanogram per mil if the drugs, uh, if the drugs want, um, will react, cross-react with the ketamine test strip. Yeah? So it needs high uh, concentration of promethazine to be able to react 
or cross react with the ketamine test strip. So in that in that case, the promethazine do not cross react with uh, ketamine test strip. Case number three, a patient comes in and shows signs of child abuse or, child, or drug assisted sexual assault. So the clinician believed that the urine drug immunoassay is indicated to determine if the victim had been drugged. And there was a request for urine benzodiazepine immunoassay test and it was negative. And we need to understand that most ben benzodiazepine test strips are designed to detect no diazepam or ozazepam at a cut -off, cut off concentration of 300 nanogram per mil. And most commonly prescribed and most commonly abused benzodiazepine, including aprazolam, clonazepam, lorazepam, flunitrazepam, do not metabolize to ozazepam or nor diazepam and do not share these metabolites. So these uh, would be missed eh, by urine drug testing. Um, but a newer generation of immunoassay are able to detect aprazolam due to cross-reactivity to the strip. Yeah? So we are taking advantage of this cross-reactivity of aprazolam to the benzodiazepine test strip yeah? so that uh, we are able to now to detect a positive uh, results if the patient is actually taking aprazolam. Yeah? So aprazolam, um, they need only a concentration of 200 nanogram per mil of aprazolam to be able to give a positive uh, benzodiazepine strip with a cutoff of 300 nanogram per mil. But others, for example, clonazepam, fluoridrazepam, and midazolam, it needs a higher concentration of the drugs in the urine uh, to be able to cross react with the benzodiazepine uh, strip, yeah. So, in other words, they, are, do, they do not cross react with the test strip, yeah. So, this information are available in the, the OCT package insert. So, a negative urine drug screen can be the result of um, five different circumstances. There is no drug or drug metabolites in the urine. Uh, they do not use or the patient do not use the substance within the window of detection. There is a drug in the specimen but at the concentration below the detection threshold. And the strip use does not detect some drugs within a drug class due to cross uh, structural diversity. And it could be due to lack of cross reactivity with a newer emerging psychoactive substance. So do you really need that emergency drug screen? Because of the inadequacies of the current urine drug immunoassay, clinicians should rely more on their professional judgment. The evaluation of patients with suspected toxicity or drug abuse relies on clinical assessment based on the history of ingestion or exposure and the clinical symptoms and sign. So alteration of vital signs can be extremely helpful in narrowing down potential etiologies and combined with other findings to establish a toxic syndrome or toxidrome. Okay? So recognition of poisoning agent by toxidrome should take precedence to the results of rapid urine drug screen and should be the basis of clinical decision making. So any guidelines to recommend urine drug screening? Um, a clinical guideline was developed by the a collaboration of UK National Poison Information Service and the Association for Clinical Biochemists uh, recommends against the availability of the emergency drug screen. It was published in 2014 and there wasn't any new updates from uh, since then. So the group one is the essays that should be available on a 24-hour basis in all acute hospitals. This does not include emergency drug screen. Yeah? So a guideline of Alberta Medical Association Canada also makes the same recommendation. In the US, is there any uh, guidelines for this? A National Academy of Clinical Biochemistry Laboratory Medicine Practice Guideline, a recommendation for the use of laboratory tests to support poison patients who present to emergency department. Uh, in this guideline, 
they actually divide the test into tier 1 and tier 2 tests. Tier 1 test is the selected serum or plasma quantitative test and the urine qualitative test. So in US, they recommend the urine qualitative test as listed in this table 3 to be available uh, at all time, 24 hours, on a stack basis, in any clinical lab that supports an active ED, regardless of rural or urban area. And if the patients remain intoxicated or comatose, or if the pay or, or the condition cannot be explained by the first tier testing, or if a large spectrum screening is necessary to find substance that could be clinically significant, they will proceed with the tier, te tier two test to detect the drugs and toxin which is not identified by tier one test. This is uh, using a specialized equipment, but of course it is time consuming. So at the end of the day, we have to follow the law of toxicology. We need to treat the patient, not the poison. Yeah? So supportive treatment is still the mainstay in acute management. So as a take home message, drug abuse screening tests provide convenient testing technology, but users of POCT device need to understand the sensitivity, specificity of the device, the spectrum of the analyte, the drugs and the metabolites detected by the device, any known interference from drugs or metabolites that could affect interpretation of the results. And the users of POCT should refer to POCT package instead or the manufacturer. And the urine drug testing has to be interpreted in the light of its many shortcomings. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Noah Shikin, for her topic of the updates in urine drug test in emergency. So now we can be more focused on which patients that we want to do the test and not. Okay, so uh, I hope everyone also will be more clear on that. Thank you. And next, uh, we'll move, move to our last uh, lecture today, which is role of toxicology laboratory in the diagnosis, treatment, prognosis, and prevention of poisoning by, by Prof. Eileen Yabis. Okay, thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. First, let me thank the organizers of the Ford EMSS event for today, and uh, also for the kind introduction earlier. So I am Professor Eileen Yabes, and I will be discussing the role of analytical toxicology laboratory in the diagnosis, treatment, prognosis, and prevention of poisoning. So I'm also an analytical toxicology consultant of the UPPGH National Poison Management and Control Center. For the learning objectives for this uh, topic, at the end of the lecture, the participants are expected to have an overview of the scope of services of an analytical toxicology laboratory. Also to understand the key considerations in its type of toxicology laboratory service, I have an overview of the different diagnostic modalities commonly used in analytical toxicology and appreciation of the role of toxicology laboratory in the diagnosis, treatment, prognosis, and prevention of poisoning. So let me begin with a definition of what is analytical toxicology. Analytical toxicology is a hybrid of analytical chemistry and basic toxicology. It is concerned with the qualitative and quantitative methods of analysis of either biological and non-biological specimen. It also deals with methodology for isolation, the sample preparation steps, detection, identification, and subsequent quantification of toxic substances or poison. This is just to show you a general schema in an analytical toxicology laboratory. A specimen is usually received in the laboratory, either a biological specimen or a non-biological specimen. 
screening test is usually done, use, usually utilizing a spot test, colorimetric, or thin layer chromatography. And these are not so sensitive and not so specific tests. That's why it's called screening test. Then there are tests that warrants confirmatory testing. One example is in drug some abuse testing. When you do confirmatory testing of these toxicants or uh, a substance or analytes uh, suspected as an um, offending agent in a poisoning case, there is usually a requirement for sample preparation and purification technique. And then depending on the type of toxicant, if it's a non-volatile substance or a volatile substance, then a, an appropriate analytical methodology will be uh, utilized in the testing of this specimen. So if it is an inorganic compound, non-volatile substance, you are now expecting some heavy metals. And heavy metals are the most appropriate method for heavy metals are atomic absorption, spectrophotometer, and other uh, uh, type of AA like the cold vapor and graphite furnace. And if you want a more sensitive and more specific technique, then you go further utilizing ICP and ICPMS. If the offending toxicant is expected, the expected offending toxicant is an organic compound, non-volatile, then maybe you are expect, suspecting a pharmaceutical, a traditional illicit drugs or new psychoactive substances, either marine and plant toxins and other biotoxins, and of course, by pesticides also. Then you can further do the testing by doing thin layer chromatography and immunoassays. And if again, if you need more sensitive and specific method, then go further by using the HPLC, UPLC, or LCMSMS. Now, if you are dealing with an alcohol, solvents, gases, and some pesticides that are volatilizable, then you can, uh, the laboratory usually do some colorimetric method and then further utilizing gas chromatography uh, with a head space, especially for alcohols and solvents. And then for more, again, for more sensitive and specific method, then the utilization of GZMSMS. But again, all of this highly sensitive and specific methods uh, requires ex expertise, uh, more advanced technology that must be available in the laboratory. So more of the, most of the time, the emergency, uh, emergency toxicology utilizes the, the spot test or colorimetric or thin layer chromatography, the point of care testing devices, which we're in, result can be available in a short period of time as compared when you are doing some confirmatory testing. Or if the physicians are requiring a more, con, uh, more sensitive and uh, uh, specific method, then it is expected that results are not available immediately while the patient's still in the emergency room. So again, I just want to further elaborate on the interpretation of results and even on the, the whole process of testing in an analytical toxicology. Remember that I've mentioned that uh, the, the definition of analytical toxicology is a combination of basic analytical chemistry and toxicology. So it is important that the nature of this toxicant is known, no? Because this will dictate the correct specimen and the time of collection, the specimen container, transport and handling. It is important to know the pharmacokinetic property of the toxicant. When you say pharmacokinetic, it is important to know how the heavy metals or gases, vapor, emission, solvents, pesticides are absorbed, disposed, metabolized, excreted, and its toxicity. It is also important to know the half-life of this toxicant the extent of biotransformation so that the laboratory is uh, guided if the parent drug or a metabolite has to be uh, detected in the laboratory. Even the route of exposure, the concentration of the toxicant so that the laboratory can also apply a more sensitive if you are expecting trace levels. And of course, the duration of exposure. So it is really important to know the nature of the toxicant because this will dictate the correct specimen, the proper timing of collection of this specimen 
and even the the indicator of exposure is it the parent or the metabolite or the effect of this toxicant as i've mentioned earlier in the previous slide it is important to know the nature of the toxicant because laboratory will then be guided if the testing will be directed to a biomarker of exposure. When you say biomarker of exposure, it is the substance or its metabolite or the product of an interaction that is measured in a compartment or bodily fluid. Biomarkers of exposure identify and measure chemical residues in tissue or body fluids, metabolites of xenobiotic compounds or physiological outcomes that occur as a result of exposure. In this case, if the exposure is lead, then detection of lead in blood is the biomarker of exposure. A biomarker of effect is a measurable alteration, which could either be biochemical, structural, functional, or behavioral in an organism that can be associated with an established or potential health impairment or disease. Biomarkers of early disease indicate early biochemical or functional alterations. Just like our example for a biomarker of exposure, let's say the exposure is on lead, if you will detect the biomarker of effect, then the lead can be, uh, the biomarker of effect for lead is now the zinc protoporphyrin in blood or even the, the urine coproporphyrin. So you're now not detecting the biomarker of exposure, which is lead, but this time you are now detecting the biomarker of effect of the lead exposure. Another way uh, to detect exposure or to detect the toxicant is to detect the biomarker of susceptibility. A biomarker of susceptibility is the marker of an ab ability to adversely respond to the challenge of exposure to a chemical, such as the genes that can make certain individuals more vulnerable to toxins. So again, with our example on lead, lead in blood as a biomarker of exposure, the protoporphyrin or coproporphyrin as a biomarker of effect. This time, a biomarker of susceptibility for this particular toxicant, which is lead, is now the aminolevulinic acid, acid dehydrogenase or ALAD in lead. So again, it's either the laboratory will give a result of a biomarker of exposure, a biomarker of effect, or a biomarker of susceptibility. So the physicians, the emergency physicians should understand that there are these different ways to assess the biomarker of uh, exposure, effect, or susceptibility. Now, moving forward, for the scope of services of an analytical toxicology laboratory and the key considerations in its type of toxicology laboratory services. So analytical toxicology is important in acute poisoning, and that is emergency toxicology. The following are uh, not necessarily an emergency toxicology, but take note that these people with these scenarios can come in in the emergency room, such as for evaluation of treatment efficacy, wherein you do repeat testing or serial testing, for monitoring for drugs of abuse, that is, Nowadays, not only limited to traditional illicit drugs or TIDs, but we are now considering the new psychoactive substances, which is emerging and a global uh, problem. No? Uh, analytical toxicology is also important in therapeutic drug monitoring, in chemical incidents, in forensic analysis, in environmental and occupational toxicology, such as health assessments. So when you encounter patients in the emergency room, you're not just thinking of an acute poisoning. You have to consider that the patient that you are seeing could be chronically exposed in the environment or from the occupation. That's why the history taking is really important. And of course, analytical toxicology is also important in research. Now for acute poisoning, it is the, the main aim is really to, er, to age in the early diagnosis of poison patients, leading to prompt clinical management and treatment, thereby reducing the risk of mortality and morbidity. And this is uh, commonly encountered in drug overdose, specifically of uh, pharmaceuticals. Also in the Philippines, pharmaceuticals is commonly encountered 
uh, cases for drug overdose. Also, substance exposures to solvents, gases, pesticides, heavy metals, and other toxins in the workplace or environment. In terms of emergency toxicology, assays that might be required urgently to guide clinical management could be the carboxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin, the test for iron, the test for lithium, for toxic alcohols such as methanol, ethanol, ethanol, or even the ethylene glycol, which will, you know, even if it's ethanol is no longer found in the, the bodily fluid, then ethylene glycol can, you know, um, give an indication of exposure or even the test for formate concentration, which is a for proxy for methanol. That's test for paracetamol, salicylate, paraquat, and of course, general urine drug screen. But again, we have to understand the proper interpretation of urine drug screen. Again, go back to the toxicokinetics and toxicokinetics of that particular uh, traditional illicit drugs or new psychoactive substances. Then there are assays that might be required less urgently for management, such as cholinesterase. But there are point of care testing devices for cholinesterase, but take note of the limitation of the plasma cholinesterase because this is urgent or the test is rapid, the result is rapid, but there is that uh, indication that this is a pseudo cholinesterase. And but when you test for the RBC cholinesterase, which will really give an information on the exposure, then this takes a longer period of time as compared with doing the rapid test for pseudocolonesterase. So test for metals, methotrexate, thallium, and other general toxicology screen may not be required urgently for management. You, as an emergency physician, you really have to base it on the history and the clinical manifestation of the patient encountered in the emergency room. And of course, the point of care testing devices are available, such as a simple spot test, small bench top analyzers, the qualitative urine screening, which is the use of point of care testing devices, and other uh, devices like the pulse co oximeter fitted to a blood gas analyzer for the measurement of carboxyhemoglobin and methemoglobin, which is relevant in guiding the physicians in the emergency room for immediate clinical management. Now, what are the common concerns in emergency toxicology? One of the common concerns is when should specimen be collected for emergency toxicology testing? The rule of the thumb is that in emergency situations, there are no specific timing recommendations. Specimens should be collected as soon as possible if toxicity is suspected. But again, in the interpretation of result, you have to consider the toxicokinetics of the offending agent or toxicant. Because if you collect so early, probably the, the, the metabolite or the toxicant is still not excreted in urine if you will use urine as your biological fluid. So again, go back to the kinetics, the toxicokinetics of the toxicant, especially in the interpretation of the specimen that you collect immediately. And of course, if assessing detoxification, that is in the case of a paracetamol poisoning, retest intervals are determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Another concern is which specimens are appropriate for emergency toxicology testing. Generally, whole blood, serum, or plasma specimens are typically preferred for most testing because these specimens can provide both quantitative and qualitative information. And quantitative results can be used to assess signs and symptoms of toxicology. And urine can be used to assess acute or chronic exposure with an average window of detection of one to three days. However, uh, the use of urine is uh, common because this is non-invasive. Mostly toxicants are excreted uh, immediately. So higher concentrations are common also. Of course, not for all toxicants. And urine may be used in select cases when only qualitative information is needed. How should toxicology test results be interpreted? That's another concern. Test results should be interpreted based on the established therapeutic or toxic range as applicable. And again, consider the timing of specimen collection relative to the time of exposure. A negative result will, is not always negative, meaning 
is does not always mean that there is no exposure. So again, it depends on the timing of specimen collection. The specimen type, is it the most appropriate or the specimen of choice for that particular uh, uh, toxic plant? And again, patient's clinical signs and symptoms of toxicity. You also have to consider the concomitant medications and factors relevant to the window of detection because this also affects the inter interpretation of results. You also have to note the adverse drug responses which can occur even when the drug concentrations are within the therapeutic range. So this is a good reference material uh, issued in 2020. They revisited the different therapeutic and toxic blood concentrations of more than 1,000 100 drugs and other xenobiotics. But take note that in case of intoxications, the blood concentration of the substance or metabolite better predicts the clinical severity of the case when compared to the assumed amount and time of ingestion. So don't just look at the levels, but you always have to compare it to the assumed amount and time of ingestion. Comparing and contrasting the clinical case against the data provided or the laboratory results, including the half-life, may support the decision for or against further intensive care. In addition, data provided are useful for the therapeutic monitoring of pharmacotherapies to facilitate the diagnostic assessment and monitoring of acute and chronic intoxication, as well as to support forensic and clinical expert opinion. So you can just access this uh, journal article. Another role of analytical toxicology is evaluation of treatment efficacy. When you do detoxification, then you have to be guided if the toxicant is still high or you already you know, managed to detoxify the patient. So toxicology test results are useful not only to determine patient exposure and assess symptoms of toxicity, but also for serial monitoring to evaluate treatment efficacy and determine if toxin concentration have decreased over time while you are detoxifying or managing the poison patient. Another role of analytical toxicology is in drugs of abuse testing. Here, there is a need for accurate detection of drugs that have relevance to clinical outcomes. There are already technologies that are rapidly evolving and emerging because of the global problem on new psychoactive substances. So our common uh, panel for drugs of abuse, of abuse testing, the POCT device is limited to the TIDs or the traditional illicit drugs. However, it is a known fact that NPS are now uh, available and it's being used. And there are no tests that have been developed to detect their presence accurately. Synthetic drugs are designed not to produce a positive result on a drug screen. So that's the purpose of this new psychoactive substances, to be not detected with a common POCT or even testing platforms in the laboratory. And of course, in drugs of abuse testing, because of the legal implication of this, there is a possibility of sample tampering. No? There is a chance to do adulteration, dilution, and even substitution. That's why in drugs of abuse testing, the sample validity testing is also included. This is to determine if the urine submitted is really authentic, uh, the integrity is there, and there's no adulteration, dilution, and substitution. The sample validity testing includes testing for creatinine, pH, and uh, specific gravity and other adulterants like glutaraldehyde and uh, many more. No? And again, in drugs of abuse testing, it is important to maintain the chain of custody. Any break in the chain of custody is a fatal flaw in drugs of abuse testing, especially if the application is, for, is with legal implication, like the one utilized in workplace drug testing. This is just uh, the cutoff for the drugs of abuse testing. It is also uh, important to know that in drugs of abuse testing, the two layer of 
screening and confirmatory is mandated by law. And the cutoff may vary from country to country, may vary from occupation to occupation, depending on what is required. Like in airline industry, the cutoff levels are even lower than what is set by SAMHSA for workplace drug testing. And a lot of countries followed the, the cutoff of SAMHSA, although some also vary or have their own uh, cutoff levels, both in screening and confirmatory testing. Another role of analytical toxicology is on therapeutic drug monitoring. This is uh, very important in personalized drug therapy, and that is to enhance the efficacy of the drug and to reduce the risk of toxicity. But TDM is important for drugs with well-established relationship between blood concentration and clinical effect. However, it is also important for drugs with unpredictable pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic relationships with those. And of course, for drugs with narrow therapeutic index, you want to maintain the therapeutic level so that you don't want to, to, you know, to give it of, you, you want to induce overdose. And at the same time, you don't want also to have it underdose. So there, the need for the laboratory to do the therapeutic drug monitoring. This is also important to assess the detection of non-adherence to drug therapy, which represents a frequent and important cause of preventable adverse reactions. Drug monitoring is employed to ensure that the patient's drug concentrations are within the therapeutic range. And these are commonly used, TDM is commonly used for antiarrhythmics, some antibiotics, anti-cancer drugs, antidepressants, immunosuppressants, and even for lithium. The goal for therapeutic drug monitoring is the measurement of the concentration of specific drugs at intervals in order to adjust dosage regimens to achieve a desired clinical effect and avoid toxic effects. The key considerations then are that all dosing and collection time details should be included on the request form. The time of dosing, the time of sample collection, the dose regimen, which is the dose, the duration, the dosage form, patient demographics, and other concomitant medications because it may interfere, no? Or it may, you know, could have a synergistic or antagonistic effect on that therapy that is being given to the, to the uh, patient. And other relevant comorbidities like renal or liver diseases because this affects the kinetics or how the body handles the toxicant. And of course, the indications for testing. Is it for toxicity or for compliance testing? The, the, why they need or why a physician need a therapeutic drug monitoring. This is just a recommended sampling times for different uh, uh, substances that are often tested for therapeutic drug monitoring. So again, samples should not be collected until drugs have reached steady state or the five half lives, as you can see it in this table, and blood should be collected at the recommended sampling time. Analytical toxicology laboratory is also important in chemical incidents. And according to World Health Organization, chemical incidents are uncontrolled release of a toxic substance potentially resulting in harm to public health and the environment or harm to the environment that will subsequently be an exposure to the human population. And again, as emergency physicians, you also encounter uh, patients uh, exposed in chemical incidents. So these are uh, cases resulting from natural events, accidental or intentional events, leading to sudden and acute or slow onset when there is a silent release of a chemical, and it can range from small releases to full-scale major emergencies. So chemical incidents may happen or may arise from anthropogenic or technological events such as explosion at a factory that stores or uses chemicals, especially toxic chemicals, contamination of the food or water supply with a chemical oil spill or leak from a storage unit during transportation, deliberate release of chemicals in conflict or terrorism. So this is another form of uh, 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 release of this chemical, you know, deliberate. 
and an outbreak of disease that is associated with a chemical exposure. And of course, uh, chemical incidents may also arise from natural sources, which includes volcanoes, earthquakes, and forest fires. And according to WHO, 65,000 deaths were caused by technological disasters between 2009 to 2018. Another role of analytical toxicology is forensic or medical legal cases. And that is the main consideration if you are dealing with forensic or medical legal cases is that to establish if toxicants are present, which is capable of contributing to death or contributor capable of causing behavioral changes and to establish if whether or not they represent legitimate use or exposure such as prescribed medications or workplace exposures. The challenges in forensic or medical legal cases is again the emergence of new drugs. The analytical platforms are not ready for these new psychoactive substances in most of the places. And there are different standards among laboratories. There are discrepancies in the interpretation of toxicological findings and in forensic or medical legal case, you have to attain the highest analytical standard in each laboratory because of its legal implication. And of course, challenges in the interpretation of post-mortem toxicological data. So the key considerations in forensic cases is how the evidence is collected. So specimen collection is important how it is tested, who conduct the analysis, how and where the analysis is performed, and of course, if an appropriate method was utilized in testing for this particular uh, specimen, either biological or non-biological, if it is a medical legal case. Usually there is a general screen or preliminary identification of alcohol followed by a confirmatory testing using a more advanced technique like, like GCMSMS or LC, uh, LCMSMS. And these are just the recommended specimens collected in post-mortem cases. Another role of analytical toxicology is important in environmental toxicology and occupational toxicology. We know that environmental toxicology is concerned with the study of chemicals that contaminate food, water, or the atmosphere, as well as toxic substances that enter bodies of waters, such as lakes, streams, rivers, and oceans. So these are the routes, uh, these are the, you know, the, the pathways of exposure. And then occupational toxicology is concerned with the health effects from exposure to chemicals in the workplace. It is important in environmental monitoring of the toxicants or chemicals present in the environment using non-biological samples such as air, water, and soil. So this will give you the external dose to which a human or a patient is exposed. So that's uh, an environmental monitoring. However, it is also important that in biological monitoring of toxic exposures from the environment as well as in workplaces. So in human biomonitoring, it plays a key role in occupational risk assessment. It complements workplace air monitoring. It can be used as part of medical health surveillance, and it can be used to perform or validate risk assessment when other approaches are unavailable or inadequate. No? Now, uh, in relation to environmental and biological monitoring, it is important to understand the chemical exposure pathways. What is the source, the pathways, and the receptor? In this case, the sources could be uh, emissions, waste, accidental releases, or even consumer goods like pharmaceuticals. And this can further contaminate the air, the soil, the surface water, and groundwater, which are the pathways of exposure and further contaminate crops, animals, fish, drinking water before a human is exposed. So again, take note of this chemical exposure pathway, especially when you are interpreting uh, toxicology laboratory results. 
This is another figure showing the relationship between environmental, biological, and exposure monitoring and health surveillance. So in environmental monitoring, usually air, water, soil, food crops, and services are uh, submitted to the laboratory for testing for that uh, indicator of exposure. And then biological monitoring, uh, biological specimens are submitted to the laboratory for the detection of the indicator of exposure. Again, let's go back to the biomarkers. Either you are detecting the biomarker of exposure, the bio biomarker of effect, or the biomarker of risk or susceptibility in the biological monitoring aspect. I think this is the last uh, role. Of course, this is not limited to age. There are other roles of analytical toxicology, but analytical toxicology laboratory is also important in research. So this is just to show you that there is a paper that I found in the internet. It's an appraisal of antidotes effectiveness, evidence of the use of phytoantidotes and biotechnological ad advancements. And even in cases wherein the exposure is unknown, then there is a laboratory in research who can also do the de uh, determination of the LD50 using a mouse bioassay. So research is also important role of analytical toxicology laboratory. Moving on with all of those roles of analytical toxicology, I'll want to give you some overview of the different diagnostic modalities commonly used in analytical toxicology. So, uh, for biomarker of exposure or, or effect to pesticides, pesticide residues or the pe degradation and conversion products, metabolites, reaction products, and impurities are commonly measured in biological samples such as urine, fat, blood, serum, breast milk. And again, if you are suspecting an organochlorine, then fat is a good uh, or the most appropriate uh, biological fluid. So here is a table showing the different biomarkers of exposure to some pesticides for urinary residues of pesticides and their metabolites. You can use urine, blood, adipose tissue, such as for organochlorines, as I mentioned earlier, chlordane and heptachlordidity, breast milk, both for OCs also, skin residues for aldicarb, cholinesterase determination is also an important biomarker of exposure. Or this time, if you are testing for cholinesterase, this is now a biomarker of effect. As mentioned earlier, RBC cholinesterase is used in occupational monitoring as well as health assessment studies as a monitoring tool or biomarker of effect of organophosphate exposure. This method utilizes an enzymatic potentiometric type of analysis. It requires freshly collected 3 ml heparinized blood transported in ice to the laboratory and I have mentioned here that it is available at the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology in my institution at UP College of Medicine, and it is actually giving services to our UP National Poison Management and Control Center located at the Philippine General Hospital. Another modality is to test for the natural toxins in the environment like snake venom. Although auxiliary tests are used in the diagnosis and management of snake bites, like the use of platelet count, blood count, you know, clotting profile, serum biochemistry, urinalysis, renal function, and even ECG, there are now novel diagnostics that are utilizing enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays. In Brazil, they have a differential diagnosis on a genus level. In Asia, there is a, an ELISA that will detect Taiwan cobra, specifically their N atravenum in biological samples with a detection limit of one nanogram per ml. There is also available immunochromatographic strip for Taiwan cobra and uh, utilizing lateral flow assays, impedimetric immunoassays, infrared imaging, and even PCR based methods. But this again requires a high. Um, uh, well-experienced analyst and also an advanced technique. No? But the, the novel diagnostics are available for snake bites patients. And of course, choose, and this is important when choosing the correct 
antivenom for this snake bite cases that you encountered in the emergency room settings. Another uh, modality or another technique is to de detect the detection of marine toxin exposure. However, diagnosis of marine toxin exposure in clinical management are mostly based on signs and symptoms and a history of seafood or shellfish consumption or history of shell collection, swimming or wading in the sea, diving or aquarium maintenance or the activities that the patient had done prior to consult in the emergency room. However, confirmation is often made through the identification of the marine toxin. Usual specimen are the flesh of shellfish or fish or in biological fluid like urine and blood. So here I found a method that is a rapid and sensitive ELISA screening assay for several paralytic shellfish toxins in human urine. So this ELISA can detect saxitoxin, gonyotoxin, the cabarmoyl gonyotoxin, and neosaxitoxin at different uh, detection limits, no? as low as 0 0.02 nanogram per ml for saxitoxin and so on and so forth. So there is a rapid and sensitive ELISA screening for marine toxins. That is not only for the flesh or shellfish, but also for urine or blood. Another way to monitor toxic exposure is the toxic exposures from air. Here we are now thinking of the uh, uh, volatiles or the organic solvents. No? And uh, yes, we have the ambient air quality monitoring stations that will detect the sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxides, ground level ozone, carbon monoxide, the BTX, no? and even the particulate matters. And of course, part of the ambient air quality monitoring station is the meteorological parameters. And aside from this environmental monitoring, uh, testing for this BTEX can also be done in an analytical toxicology laboratory. And it will require urine and, of course, a more a sensitive method like the headspace gas chromatography mass spectrometry. This is a method that can simultaneously detect 15 BTEX or benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and silene using a headspace GCMS. Monitoring of environmental and occupational toxic exposure, like the volatile organic compounds, the persistent organopollutants, and even other pollutants like phthalates and isocyanates. Here, you can see that blood, urine, even human semen, breath, and breast milk can be used in the detection of this uh, environmental and occupational toxic exposures. Toxic exposures in firefighters, no? Biomonitoring bio in fire, firefighters for volatile organic compounds, semi-volatile organic compounds, even for pops or persistent organic pollutants and metals can also be done in an analytical toxicology. In this a, a study done in, I think this is in Canada. I'm not so sure, huh? I think it's in Canada. Let me just, uh, I'm not so sure of that, but this study showed that uh, results showed exposure to a wide range of toxic chemicals due to fire smoke among firefighters, potentially exceeding the range of exposure of other occupations. So there is really need for future biomonitoring studies, recognizing and assessing the range of chemical exposure firefighter space would be beneficial. And again, in drugs of abuse testing, I mentioned a while ago the problem on new psychoactive substances. Nowadays, uh, this is still limited to many laboratories, but the, the emerging technologies are also available for the screening method for the new psychoactive substances. And even the point of care testing devices are now increasing the number of uh, substances that can be detected belonging to the new psychoactive substances. This is another study, uh, systematic screening for NPS. And uh, they found out that from March 2019 to 2020, of the 5,079 forensic cases, it reveals that a 3.4% positivity with no psychoactive substances. 
And while 94% involved designer benzodiazepines like the flubromazolam, etizolam, however, 5% involved novel synthetic opioids such as the furanyl fentanyl and acryl fentanyl and so on and so forth. So the, there is really currently a challenge in the detection of new psychoactive substances, a big challenge to the laboratory. So in summary, scope of services of an analytical toxicology laboratory, we have shown the different scope, although this is not limited to that. And uh, I have mentioned also some key considerations in each type of toxicology laboratory service. And also I have uh, shown selected diagnostic modalities commonly used in analytical toxicology. And I hope this lecture gave you an appreciation of the role of toxicology laboratory in the diagnosis, treatment, prognosis, and prevention of poisoning. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you to Prof. Eileen for her very detailed lecture. Okay, so uh, since we are a bit uh, delayed on our time, so we will have a short break. We'll start back uh, at 11.20 with the forum. So I hope all the uh, participants can fill up their burning questions in the Q&A section so that we can discuss it during the forum. Drug and Poison Information Services, DPIS, Integrated Drug and Poison Information Services, it pits consultation services, research and documentation, toxicology laboratory services, and poison education and prevention are the various services offered by the National Poison Center. The Drug and Poison Information Service, DPIS, is the focal of the Malaysian NPC. DPIS is administered through the NPC call center, which responds and provide consultation on poisoning emergencies. The call center is meant by trained pharmacists. This service remains available beyond office hours for an additional five hours in the evening on weekdays and eight hours on weekends and public holidays. Consultation and assistance provided by the DPIS are processed in advance by the information management system which is based on standard reference and also databases. All calls received at the call center, including provided consultation, are recorded for purpose of training and also quality assurance. Follow-up calls are made by the pharmacist in charge if necessary. It's necessary is assess a case-by-case -case basis depending on the nature of the poisoning. Most calls inquiries associated with the poisoning management are from national hospital and clinics. There are also inquiries from the households and also factories. However, these are sporadic. Advisory on the general and also non-urgent inquiries associated with the poisonings, drugs and venoms can also be directed to the National Poison Center on the official email, which is prnnet at usm.my. The NPC also provides various drug poison information training services for specialized groups such as pharmacists, allied health professionals, and pharmacy undergraduates. It also offers industrial training for four to six weeks for pharmacy undergraduates within and also outside USM. The NPC also provides subspecialty training facilities for medical specialists from the fulfillment set by the Ministry of Health. Subspecialty training involves chemical toxicology and also occupational health within the toxicology group. The NPC Integrated Drug and Poison Information Service, which is known as EPITS, has developed a wide range of systems for use of prescription auditing, antibiotic auditing, pesticide information, drug information, poison reporting and information, adverse drug reaction, therapeutic drug monitoring and unit dose distribution. EPITS also offers abstracting service drug information request, Malaysian registered drug listing, and Malaysian hospital formulary service. 
Consultation service on poisoning management guidelines is also available at the NPC. Additionally, the National Poison Center offers service for translation of material safety data sheet or review for chemical pesticide manufacturers. The NPC also has the expertise to provide consultation on the technical documents associated with the providing the required consultation for drug and poison related legal cases. The Poison Education and Prevention Unit or service was one of the two services pioneered by the National Poison Center when it actually commenced operation back in 1995. The PEP unit provides systematic continuous education on poisoning prevention for the benefit of healthcare professionals, students, and the general public. Many of the PEP programs are collaborative effort between the NPC and government agency, non-governmental organization, which is NGOs. The PEP core program are mostly associated with the chemical safety, rational drug use, tobacco control, and also substance abuse. The PEP program are structured in, in a way to support the essential domains of health promotion strategies, such as health literacy, building capacity, and community empowerment. Okay, so now we are back. Uh, so I'd like to invite all the speakers uh, and our panelists, which are our panelists, uh, Dr. Sabrina, Prof. Vine, Dr. Noa Shikin, and Prof. Eileen for the forum. Okay, uh, so I will go with the first question from the Q&A box first, which uh, I'd like to uh, give it to Dr. Prof. Dr. Prof. Vinay and also Dr. Ruth. Uh, good morning, Dr. Several times in ER, I found cyanide poisoning or other chemical substance that induce methemoglobinemia, such as carbon monoxide. All patients die in emergency department because our ER don't have methylene blue injection for antidote. My question is, there any, is there any substitution for methylene blue? as antidote and what are the prognosis if we can give methylene blue for the case? Uh, so, uh, Dr. Ruth or uh, Prof. Vinay first, please. Thank you. Yeah, Prof. Prof can answer first. So, uh, usually, in the case of beth hemoglobinemia, if uh, the patient is not very severe, they, they should have a time for us to find for the battery blue. It will be not very sudden, like a cyanide poisoning, that more sudden or more severe. Uh, actually, I think that if, if you cannot find the uh, battery blue on time, uh, we, uh, we keep the oxygen to the patient, and uh, sometimes we infill the packed red cell cell that might might helpful in the case of they also have anemia as well because uh, methylmercury is a uh, oxidative stress so uh, many cases of methylmercury the patient also have anemia as well have a hemolysis so uh cell infusion uh, will be very helpful uh, uh, in the textbook some of the textbook mentioned about the uh, vitamin C in the high dose of IV vitamin C. But uh, I'm not sure that, that it is effective enough for treat the CVA patient of the met hemoglobinemia. That is my answer. Actually, we, uh, we recommend that for the hospital, especially for the tertiary hospital the, in the emergency setting, they should uh, stop some uh, methylene blue in their pharmacies. Uh, how about Dr. Good? Thank you, Prof. Vine, for your opinion and answer.
the question actually is uh, mixed lah because if uh, he's saying that uh, if, if the participant is uh, questioning about cyanide poisoning so uh, it should be the uh, antidote of uh, whether hydroxycobalamin or also sodium uh, <coughs> uh, sodium nitrate plus uh, sodium thiosulfate uh, for the antidote um, uh, for the met hemoglobinemia part uh, has been uh, answered by uh, Prof. Minai. Uh, having said that, if uh, we are in the hospital setting, the methylene blue should be available, especially those who have the uh, uh, obstetric and gynecology department because they also use uh, methylene blue as well. I mean, uh, that is uh, one other thing. So, um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, so, oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so uh, I I not I did not I, I have not answered about the cyanide. The setting is cyanide poisoning is different from methylcobinemia. So this is quite really severe and quite rapid intoxication. Um, uh, unfortunately, if we do not have uh, the the antidote in the severe case, we might not be able to save. The patient's life, uh, but if uh, not severe enough, it might be. Uh, I know that uh, many many hospitals they do not have uh, cyanide antidote because this is not a common poisoning. But if they occur, quite very really difficult. That that our painful point uh, in in the past in Thailand as well. Uh, but right now we have a cyanide antidote in all the general hospital in Thailand. Uh, in the past, if some hospital do not have uh, antidote, uh, we, we suggest them that uh, the sodium nitrite, uh, they can find uh, in the uh, operation room. It is a substance that is used for anti-corrosive for the instrument. Uh, so they can ask the sodium nitrite from the, uh, from the uh, operation room whether they have the sodium nitrite and use that in the emergency case. Uh, if, they, if, they, if they can save the patient's life uh, and uh, for the sodium thiosulfate, uh, we can ask from the, the old, very old remedies of and topical antifungus. Perhaps some have so the hospitals some still have that. Uh, we can use that too. That operation this is just 25% of uh, sodium thiosulfate, the same solution. So in emergency case, the, the patient was very severe, we need to treat them by this. And uh, looking for might be the complications such as an infection after we give them because the preparation might not sterile. But in our, in our experience in the past, it, it very rarely occurred. That, that's all that we can do for the cyanide poisoning. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Vinay and Dr. Wood, uh, for your answer. I hope uh, the participant who asked is uh, satisfied and all of us also learn uh, a bit more about it. Okay, so the next question is one I'd like to uh, uh, put forward to Dr. Ashikin and also Prof. Eileen. Is a uh, point of care testing for shellfish poisoning cost effective? And is it recommended because most of the time, People eating shellfish will be having a bit of abdominal discomfort with or without diarrhea. And sometimes during the algal bloom, causing the neural symptom or amnesty. Uh, thank you. So, okay, so let me answer that one. Uh, I think I mentioned in my slide that in marine toxin poisoning, clinical management or the clinical history and uh, signs and symptoms is the initial thing that has to be done because there are specific toxidromes for each of this uh, paralytic shellfish poisoning cases or the different marine toxins. But for confirmation, then there is the necessity for this point of care testing device. No? And again, uh, when you say confirmation, probably in the future, there will be a more need for that if there are already specific antidotes to each kind of the marine toxins. But for now, the initial diagnosis and management is still uh, limited or still 
you know, the, the, the best option still is to go back to the clinical manifestation of the patient. Yeah, I do agree with Prof. I mean, yeah, uh, because of this um, QCT, sometimes the uh, sensitivity and specificity is the things that is actually limited. Yeah? So uh, at the end of the day, we have to go back to the clinical uh, sign and symptoms to, to assess the patient. Okay. I agree with all of you that uh, I think that we need for, uh, we need just a clinical presentation to, to make the diagnosis, the lab uh, will be not very uh, helpful in this sitting. Okay. Uh, okay. So we, I, I just like to ask a good question, which is, was in a Q&A section just now, which already Dr. Root answered, but would like to ask about uh, opinions of other panelists. Uh, in, is there any... Uh, sorry. Uh, do you still use multiple dose activated charcoal for wafering goddesside in your institution? So uh, just now Dr. Root answered that uh, majority of cases uh, we have seen in just for free, but uh, most of them take small amounts. So only uh, a few cases need vitamin K. So uh, what is the opinion about other panelists? That, that is for- Can you tell me again, uh, what, what, what is, uh, so, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Sorry, Dr. Uh, Ruth, sorry. Uh, I, th I think uh, I can answer uh, with what happening in, in Malaysia generally. Uh, because uh, most of the cases that we have seen is still uh, warfarin or super warfarin uh, overdoses or poisoning. Uh, rarely that we have uh, zinc phosphide, a few cases, and also tetramine, maybe one or two uh, for the past few years. So uh, that is the one that we know. Uh, the one that we don't know, uh, we don't know what actually the outcome of the patient. So uh, in majority of the cases that we've seen, actually the ingestion is not that significant amount. Uh, there are also one or two patients that actually presented with repetitively ingesting the same kind of uh, warfarin uh, agent uh, that coming in every week, every month, uh, like that, uh, that uh, might need uh, I mean, uh, uh, might need uh, to be treated with a uh, uh, vitamin K oral um, a few times. Uh, that is uh, with regards to our, my previous uh, hospital attachment. Um, but uh, yeah, so that is why um, our experience in Malaysia, we uh, haven't actually uh, given uh, the uh, either SDAC or MDAC with regards to those kind of uh, poisoning because for us uh, when we uh, do the baseline uh, regulation profile and when we follow up there are no not significant um, uh, INR changes and the patient is asymptomatic and uh, the patient was then discharged well so I'm not sure about other countries maybe can can uh, enlighten us uh, thank you okay, so Profine you want to share something with us just now uh, so uh, I just to make sure that I answered uh, the right question. Is it for the uh, buffering and anticoagulant only, not for all uh, type of poisoning? Is that correct? Oh, okay. For multiple, there's uh, activated charcoal. Okay. Okay. So uh, for uh, for us in Thailand, if the patient uh, intoxicate from buffering or even the long acting anticoagulant. Uh, we do not recommend the, the repeated dose of activated charcoal. Uh, the poison that we recommend to use uh, uh, activated charcoal is like uh, amatoxin poisoning that the patient will, will take the amatoxin much more. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pofine. Uh so uh, a few questions from our organizing committee side. So uh, this one I like to forward it to Prof Eileen and also Dr. Ashikin. Uh, so sometimes we hear that ingestion of cough mixture have been said to be possible giving false positive during the urine drug test. So what is your opinion on this? Uh, 
see Dr. Aishikin first. Thank you. Prof. Prof first. Can you repeat the question? If the what's the exposure? Uh, sometimes they say injection of cough mixture is said to give a false positive during the urine drug test. So we like, would like to know what is your opinion about this? Yeah, uh, again, as I think that was mentioned in the lecture of Dr. Narishikin, you really have to go back to the package insert of the POCT device you are using because the specificity or the cross-reactivity vary from brand to brand or to the antibody that is being used in that particular POCT. So again, if you go to that package insert and try to find out there's uh, substances that can interfere with it. And for cough syrup, probably it will, you know, it can uh, cross interfere with the opcates because the op in POCT, what is being detected is the whole group of opiates. So check if there is that component of the cup serum, as cup syrup that is cross-reacting in that particular POCT device. It's possible if it's listed there, but they cannot claim that it is uh, you know, cross-reacting if it's not tested there. Just to give an overview that when you do methods development and validation of this POCT, this cross-reactivity, this sensitivity and specificity are being tested. So they can declare which one will cross-react. And usually this is part or responsibility of the manufacturers. So I think even the clinical toxicologists will go back to that if the claim of the patient is really true or not. Dr. Narashikin, what's yes, your- Yes, Prof. Um, yeah, it depends on the type of uh, cosmic, uh, cough mixture as well, whether say, uh, whether it's contained codeine, huh? It depends. Huh? So if uh, most of the opiate, traditional opiate immune assay uh, can detect morphine and also codeine, uh, but uh, you still need to refer to the package insert. Uh, the cough mixture can be um, uh, contain other ingredients and whether or not it will uh, cross-react with the uh, test strip, uh, it will depend uh, from brand to brand. But um, if you are um, wanted to uh, confirm about it, you can send to the lab. We will do the, uh, a confirmatory, confirmatory testing that uh, we will show whether uh, the patient is actually taking uh, no codeine or not, or, or actually the patient is actually taking uh, morphine instead. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. Eileen and Dr. Noishikin for your wonderful input. So uh, we also have another question. This is for Dr. Wood. Uh, do we have any collaboration between our agriculture department and toxicology group for prevention of pesticide and herbicide poisoning? Uh, yes, Dr. Um, for prevention part, uh, because uh, I am from the uh, uh, clinical uh, clinician uh, in the emergency department, um, so uh, for us clinicians to go out uh, for the uh, prevention part, yeah, uh, uh, possible. Um, but uh, for now, I think the prevention is uh, being made um, uh, majority by the our National Poison Center uh, with regards to the uh, creating awareness. What I am uh, actually uh, have the fact now is that uh, with regards to our institution uh, in Ipoh, particularly, there are actually uh, one grant being submitted by our psychiatric department uh, for, for the uh, awareness with regards to um, pesticides poisoning, uh, whether the patient is actually ingesting OPs or uh, paraquat. So that is a uh, grant uh, derived uh, or grant initiated uh, but I am not quite aware uh, with regard as to whether there's any such of collaboration. Uh, for now, I think uh, for the uh, College of Emergency Physician SIG, there are no such collaboration as yet. Uh, but for other uh, uh, agents, uh, maybe we can have uh, their, their input uh, uh, from our counterparts in the in a Malaysian National Poison Center. I'm sure they they do a lot of uh, actually preventive uh, activities 
uh, towards our public. That is for Malaysia. Okay. Uh, can we know about the uh, about how about Prof Vinay and Prof Eileen? Do you have such collaboration in your place? Thank you, Dr. Good. Okay. Okay, from the Philippines, uh, our National Poison Management and Control Center have a lot of, you know, awareness raising because pesticide poisoning is also common in the Philippines being an ag agricultural country. And the majority of our clinical toxicologists or the poison centers serves as uh, consultants of our fertilizer and pesticide authority. So there are times that I think the, the unit, the National Poison Management and Control Center gives report to the fertilizer and pesticide authority, especially if they have encountered poisoning of this toxic, of this pesticide that the patient were able to get online and sometimes these are not registered, you know, the online selling at the, that we are facing now, right? And sometimes this is not, uh, this uh, uh, claim pesticide are not regulated or not uh, licensed to be sold in the Philippines. So they have that communication open to the Fertilizer and Pesticide Authority and even for our Bureau of uh, FDA, Foods and Drugs Authority. So I think that is established in the Philippines. But again, uh, policy making is also another thing. <laughs> so we just report and probably a more collaboration on implementing policies really is still needed and needs improvement in the side of the, in the Philippines. Thank you, Prof. Eileen. And how about Prof. Vini? Do you have uh, any opinion regarding this? Yes, uh, pesticide poisoning in the past is the first, I mean, the most common one. Uh, uh, and also produce the highest authority rate uh, compared to the other poisoning. Uh, we have uh, several collaboration between the Poison Center, Ministry of Public Health, and also Ministry of Agriculture. Um, uh, we, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, they have a program that uh, they, 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 they have a, like a safe use uh, training for the, 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 for the farmer. And uh, the poison center works as a supervision, give them information, uh, also uh, help them to train. We call the trainer, training the trainer uh, to, to, to the, uh, that, that is the activities that we help the Ministry of Agriculture. And also uh, we have a data exchange between the poison center and the Ministry of Agriculture. They give us the name of the old, uh, type of the register pesticide in uh, in our database in the poison center. So whenever we have got a patient who got uh, poison from the the pesticide, and if they can uh, tell us what name, but the trade name or generic name of that agriculture, we can search for them and uh, and check between the clinical misrepresentation and the history, as we have mentioned, and. Uh, Many times that we found that there are some non-register pesticide uh, that uh, happen in the uh, in the market and the cause of poisoning of the patient, we uh, notify the minister of agriculture to investigate and try to get rid of that uh, that type of uh, uh, pesticide. And uh, also very very common right now because these two years the Paraguay. Uh, has been banned in Thailand, but we found that the the uh, the the product still in the the black market, and uh, sometimes right now it's quite difficult because it is legally banned, so it is illegal. So some product that contain paraquat right now they do not have a label for paraquat. You know that that's quite difficult for us to make the diagnosis or to know that whether it is paraquat or glufosinate or even glyphosate, that that's a problem. And uh, we, we have to work very closely uh, in this problem as well. <clears throat> okay, next, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Ashikin, 
if you have any uh, special experience with requiring the uh, you as a pathologist itself, like a uh, former clinician asking for a specific test or anything while managing a, a poisoning patient. Is there any occurrence before this that happened in your place? We can share with us. Oh, okay. Uh, actually, um, uh, the pathologist uh, can give an input, uh, especially to the emergency department um, in terms of... Uh, for example, interpreting the, the urine drug stream. Mm -hmm. So we actually have a role in actually uh, evaluating the urine drug stream. So uh, pr because previously, um, the ED themselves actually uh, get the, the strip themselves uh, because there are so many brands out there and they actually uh, you know, comes to the ED and try to sell their, their products. So um, actually in, in, in our lab, we can do the evaluation and we can actually look uh, which um, brands uh, which are actually suits or um, follow the, the, the quality that we wanted to, to, to have. So uh, in that case, we actually are closely, uh, you know, work, working closely with the ED uh, physician to come up with um, a standard or, uh, or we call it a centralized a tender or purchasing for the uh, strip, yeah? So that uh, in terms of evaluation and also uh, the quality of the strip is actually controlled or uh, managed and then assessed by the people in our lab. Uh, so that's, that's the, the first thing that we actually wanted to have a working you know, together with the ED so that you know, um, uh, the, the, the strip are actually uh, in good quality. And the second thing is um, when they wanted to confirm a positive uh, drug strip. Yeah? Um, at the moment, HKL or Hospital Kuala Lumpur is the only center that we have uh, LCMSMS. So we actually have a limited <laughs> in terms of instrument, the, the human resource. No? So we are actually you know, uh, um, considered as uh, the only center that we can do the LCMSMS. So, uh, in our setting, we can actually run 45 drugs on uh, LCMHMS, um, which includes uh, different uh, groups of uh, benzodiazepine, the opiates, yeah? uh, um, and then we also support the pain management clinic, yeah? uh, the opiate like oxycodone, morphicodone, uh, hydromorphone, and all that. So, um, but but we are only the, the only centered in Malaysia that have um, this LCMSMS and can provide this forty five drugs. So, and we only have one LCMSMS, so there is no backup. So that's actually the limitation in in our setting uh, So that's why I wanted to share just uh, to share with you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ashiki. Uh, next, uh, I like to ask this question to. All uh, our part, I have speakers, which are Dr. Ruth Pofine and Prof. Eileen. So uh, we would like to know if you have any special or unforgettable unique experience in managing a toxicology patient before. Uh, let me start. <laughs> in my case, as analytical toxicologist, I'm not a clinical toxicologist. I'm an analytical toxicologist. And uh, the communication between clinical toxicologists and analytical toxicologists is really important. We have a lot of cases wherein we, right there and then, we give instructions to the emergency physicians when to get the sample, when to get the sample, what is the most appropriate one. And again, in consideration of the available methodology in the laboratory. Sometimes the emergency physicians would like to have this test in this duration of time, definitely that is not possible if the limitations, just like what Dr. Norashikin have mentioned, that they only have one LCM SMS, definitely they cannot deliver the result immediately. One of the most uh, memorable, maybe in my case, but that's like 30 years ago when I'm still doing bench work in a toxicology laboratory. At the moment, I'm not in that. Uh, I'm no longer working as an analyst, but I think my worst, <laughs> worst experience 20 to 25 years ago is when a forensic 
toxic uh, forensic uh, physician get in the lab holding a vitreous humor telling me the the manifestations of that case and then asking me can you do an analysis general screen definitely for us in the laboratory we cannot test for all so again we go back to that physicians what are the manifestations at least we are guided if it's a volatile a non-volatile a pharmaceutical that the toxidrome will also give a good guide to the analyst in the laboratory so with that tandem between a clinical toxicologist and an analyst is really important in the management and immediate care of this poison patient. Actually, the National Poison Management and Control Center have, uh, uh, have evolved. Our training for analysts is now evolved into a tandem. Because before our postgraduate course in analytical toxicology only caters for medical technologists and chemists, but at this uh, the latest offering now includes pathologists and clinical toxicologists because we really want to establish the tandem between the clinical toxicologist and uh, analytical toxicologist in the overall uh, management. You know they can help each other, and again patient life is important. So that's the main goal of both. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Eileen. Uh, so basically, we can see that uh, the understanding between the pathologist and the clinician is very important for us to uh, proceed with the management of the patient. So uh, maybe uh, either Prof. Vinay or Dr. Good first about your experience. Or Dr. Good first. For me, uh, every toxicology or toxinology cases, uh, I would say is a, a post a, a challenge lah. Because uh, I would not consider as, for example, managing a paracetamol poisoning is simple enough. Because if the paracetamol poisoning is complicated, for example, is a supratherapeutic or RSTI or whatever, so we need to uh, actually um uh judge or dig into the history. Uh, for us to effectively manage the patient. Uh, so even if, let's say, uh, we encounter every day managing a snake bite patient, for example, I would say that um, each of the patient's presentation uh, pose a, a learning point for us uh, as a clinician. Uh, uh, it is not a standard kind of management for all patients. Um, but um, the cases that I think me and my colleague uh, in uh, Ipo have uh, uh, encountered that that uh, have uh, a lot of learning point is still uh, for a few months back is actually managing a suspected uh, hydrofluoric acid uh, injection poisoning whereby actually uh, it poses a, a challenging um, diagnosis, one thing. Uh, because uh, obviously the patient come to us with unknown, uh, un uh, without uh, any uh, clues, and the patient just uh, start seizure and pulseless with uh, recalcitrant ventricular arrhythmia uh, that uh, uh, actually uh, do not respond to any of the therapy lah, that we given. So I think that is the most challenging case uh, for us, for the team. Um, and yeah, so, so that, that is uh, my experience. Huh? Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Ruth. That is also my first time hearing a uh, hydrochloride acid poisoning. Okay, uh, so next, Prof. Vinay, how about you? Yeah, I think that the practice clinical toxicology is uh, exciting. We sometimes um, work as a detector as well as a physician, so we need many uh, information uh, to, 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 to make a diagnosis of the patient. I think uh, uh, I, I have several impressions about the case that I have in the past. Uh, one is that my first case, I and I, poisoning that uh, I can detect. Uh, I remember that it's a midnight. I was uh, consulted from the neurologist that uh, uh, he had a patient, a young lady who drink uh, we call the, the dual uh, cleaning substance that don't know what it is. And uh, just 
10, uh, 10 minutes after doing that uh, uh, solution, the patient developed seizure and then coma. Uh, and after that, uh, they also have a hypotension and very severe acidosis. And the neurologist, uh, he said that he didn't know what is the diagnosis or what is the cause of the coma, seizure and coma, and, and also severe acidotic at that time. So I went to see the patient and uh, the, the, the physical, the history is just very brief and the, the physical examination, everything is just normal, just only that have tachycardia, hypotension. And uh, because his skin is quite a dark skin, quite a dark skin, but uh, uh, at that time, we found that uh, he looked quite very, uh, how can I say, red, the skin is quite red, especially his uh, mucosa, oral mucosa, for example, is quite red. So uh, what I do is just I examine the fundi to look at uh, the, the, the color of the retinal veins and artery. Uh, and I found that it is quite uh, the, the color is close together. That is the, just the size that we can make the diagnosis from that. So I make the diagnosis of cyanide poisoning at that time. And so uh, uh, I asked for the uh, cyanide antidote that they have in Ramatipati Poison Center. Uh, so uh, we can get the, uh, the cyanide antidote to the patient uh, uh, and uh, quite very quite very, uh, very fast. However, you know that uh, the time from the patient was sent to the hospital, developed the coma seizure, the neurologist worked for a while before uh, he consulted me. So they take uh, just, I think that uh, four or five hours. So uh, after we give the Sinai antidote to the patient, uh, all the clinical, I mean, uh, the, the vital size stable, the acidosis uh, come down, and but the same the thing that uh, the happen is that uh, the patient still coma, and the day after that the patient have a polyuria that's, that is a sign of the brain dead, and finally we lost a patient. Even the cyanide, I mean that we can treat the cyanide, but uh, the time is not uh, not uh, fast enough to save the patient. And uh, that that my impression, and at that time, that made me have idea that oh, I we need in the country, we need to have a stock of the China antidote in our over the country. Otherwise, we we cannot save the patient, and uh, that bring to uh, our work. Uh, Ten years after that, that we set up the program because the Thai. National Antidote Program. That right now we have a Sinai Antidote stock in every general hospital in Thailand. And uh, we, after that, I think that we we work better to save more patient life from Sinai person. That that is one of my uh, my experience that I quite quite impressed about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for finish, for sharing with us about your experience. Uh, oh, sorry. Lastly, uh, I said in that case, I said the drug for cyanide level that come back two or three days later, later. They proved it is a cyanide, and I sent the solution. I mean the product that solution. Uh, it also analyzed it for it is a potassium cyanide, and uh, that that's a they never know in the market before that. They have a cyanide solution in the market. It is an unregistered uh, product, and we try to uh, communicate with the Thai FDA to get rid of that uh, product into the market. But they still have some time. They still we still found that too as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Prof. Vini. Uh, so uh, I think that will be uh, at our end of our forum since there is no more uh, questions. So I'd like to thank all the panelists, uh, Prof. Dr. Sabrina, Prof. Vine, Dr. Ashik, and Prof. Aidy. Uh, thank you so much for your time and for your lecture.
Okay, it will, has been a very useful and a beneficial experience for us. Um, so that's all I like to. So next, uh, we will meet again for next week for our second uh, series of emergency medicine uh, scientific seminar. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, okay. So, to the participants, uh, please fill up the uh, feedback form and also you can uh, scan the QR code for your CPD points. And uh, I'd like to thank all our collaborators and sponsors. Okay, for uh, helping in us in making this uh, seminar a success. So uh, I'd like to just mention our sponsors of Malaysian Society on Toxic Technology, uh, Remote Emanation Consultation Services of Asia, uh, SIG, our College of Emergency Physicians, a special interest group in toxinology, uh, toxicology and also wilderness medicine, and also the Pusat Racun Negara. And also, uh, thank you all our collaborators, uh, MST, uh, Malaysian Society of Toxicology, REX, uh, our, all the special interest group of College Emergency Physicians, MyBIS, uh, Philippine College of Emergency Medicine, and Perdamsi, and also Westpex. Okay, thank you very much, everyone, and hope to meet you again uh, in our next series. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. It's it's my pleasure to uh, share with all of you and with all of you, and hope that we can we can have an opportunities to uh, meet again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.